Good evening. Welcome to the Select Board meeting. Today is October 29th, 2019. Uh, tonight on the agenda, we'll have liaison reports, town manager report, public comment. We'll be having a hearing for the town's tax classification, a brief discussion on the Select Board onboarding manual, then uh, a few presentations from for pedestrian and traffic safety improvements, <coughs> a vote on the train depot parking stickers, uh, we'll be following up on a discussion for meeting efficiency and select board goals, uh, and then we'll be wrapping up the future and the discussions. Um, before we jump into the liaison reports, I did want to mention um, there is an effort to make those a little bit more uh, brief. So I would ask that as you give your liaison reports, kind of provide information um, that will directly affect the community um, between now and our next meeting. Um, so why don't we start with Andy? Okay. Um, so let's go most recent to to uh, least recent. Um, first, I had a number of calls on the um, the Met at at the near the Reading Depot across from Reading Depot, the Lincoln Prescott. Number of calls, emails, texts from. Uh, concerned neighbors that about um, is the is the site complying with uh, the requirements uh, from the ZBA uh, specifically was a planned landscaped area paved over um, the, did the the now leasing sign that was up over the building adhere to signage rules for Reading uh, there's light pollution that neighbors are concerned about and what can be done about that um, and then somebody sent me a picture uh, they showed a lack of fencing in what was in what it, what was labeled the dangerous construction zone keep out area. So um, some safety concerns about that. I emailed all of these questions to the assist assistant town manager G Jean Delios. She got back to me on the sign. It was too large, and they were asked to take it down. Um, and and I'll leave it to Bob um, if he wants to say anything more on the town's response. Um, I attended the Economic Development Forum last Thursday night. I thought the, um, the consultant that presented for the planning uh, department did a great job. The topic was redeveloping that area around uh, RMLD, the Municipal Light District er area off of, uh, yeah. Um, so he, he presented some, yeah. He presented, the, this, um, this consultant presented some great ideas, concepts, visuals of what could be done with the area around, in, in the area including and surrounding the uh, RMLD. And it, the slides were really impressive and show how you can really change a, a portion of, this, of the town that doesn't look so, is not that attractive right now and make it into a really uh, appealing place that will attract, hopefully, um, pedestrians, shoppers, et cetera. Um, and I wanted to ask a question of the fellow board members. We got an email about um, three books to improve on how to improve government. I don't know if any one of you looked at that. But um, maybe for a future, I'll, I'll save these books. But they're good books. I was wondering if we could maybe discuss them at the end of the session. Select Board Book Club? Yes, <laughs> something like that. Tuesday uh, nights. <laughs> and that's it. Thanks, Andy. Mark? I just want to echo uh, what Andy said about the Economic Development Summit. It was great. It was um, nicely attended. It's a great opportunity for residents to get involved in the planning activities. There's also a, uh, a downtown group that uh, is going to be meeting on the 4th, I believe. Um, and these are, all, again, great opportunities for the community to get involved in what the plans are going to be going forward. So I want to applaud that. Uh, Vanessa and I attended an RMLD payment subcommittee meeting because we are the subcommittee. Um, which was very good and just kind of um, learning, getting all the background information in preparation for working with the uh, RMLD board. They are uh, at their next meeting, uh, there'll be some information coming forward, I believe, from the general manager um, on uh, some issues in terms of their, their plans, their capital plans and other things. And then I'm hoping that we're able to sit down um, with members of the other board and, and move this forward. 
Thank you. Thanks. John? Well, I think that um, there's a couple of things going on in public safety, one of which I'm going to I'm going to just table till it gets over to you, Ann. Okay. Um, she passed along some information to you about something that happened this week. Really very nice um, morning, but I'll defer on that. Um, one of the things that has come in, um, we've had a very important um, item come back to Reading. This is an item that was built in 1835. Uh, it's not the big red one, it's the little one uh, with wheels. And I, this is kind of a big score for Reading, in my opinion, and uh, the fire department in general. Um, retired firefighter uh, Matthew McSheehy um, was talking with the guys at the, the Boston Fire Museum one day, and one thing led to another, they're remodeling, um, and they, he said, that came from Reading. And it did. Um, and it turns out they gave it back to us. Um, so it is now back. I mean, these, these pictures are fabulous. This is uh, what's called the fountain hand tub. Now, it's very interesting because the, uh, that big fire engine that was sitting behind it in the earlier picture, that, that truck has been named the fountain after this for many years. There's always been a fountain um, fire truck in this town, but nobody knew what happened to this thing. Um, and now it's found its way home. Um, I mean, it's had a long and winding road. It was built in 1835 for the town of, for the city of Salem. When Salem got done with it, there was a small group of volunteer firefighters in Wakefield that grabbed it when it was uh, literally about the time that Wakefield was becoming South Reading. Mm -hmm. um, and they used it for a while, and then Reading reached in and um, purchased it um, for what was then half the fire department in Reading, which was, let me think, it was called the Northern Residents Association, and they were the firefighters. And they had it in a place on Main Street until that place became a home and now the place, this brand new building, the hose, the hose building that is now the place where the players are, that was the home of this thing. I mean, it's really kind of a great history. The fact that it's come home, I think is really cool. Right now it's over at the west side and they're gonna be working on where it can, how we can work on a permanent display, when it can be rolled out for special occasions. It's, it's really cool. Um, and it was kind of a joint effort between Chief Burns and, um, the, and, uh, Dip, yeah, and the DPW and uh, Matt McShee, who's, as I mentioned, a retired Reading firefighter. I, I just think it's a really good, feel good thing, you know, and I think it's really neat that this thing is back. Um, it went in service here in 1888. I mean, you stop to think about, this thing's almost 200 years old and it's still got the original paint job. Does, does it work? Um, I think so, but you have to, yeah, here's the deal with this. You have to find, so there must have been a lot of ponds and streams, because the only way it works <laughs> is if you find a pond or a stream and you throw a big hose in, you pump it, and you run the hose. It's quite a project, um, but it does still work. It's a fabulous museum. Is it still open while it's under construction? Yeah, um, there, I think it is still open, but they're kind of redoing what they wanted to do, and. You know, something like this, they have a hard time placing while they're in construction. Right, and, right. Um, and Matt McShee just said, hey, don't you think it should come home? And they agreed. So I think it's a great artifact, and it's a really feel-good thing for Reading. Um, so that's kind of my public safety update, and I really appreciate you putting those pictures up. Uh, one last thing in the category of something that's important in the next week. Um, I know that Bob read a letter to you from me. Um, and I, I was, I had hoped, I got a chance to watch the meeting. I'd hoped we'd get a little more dialogue and hope later in the meeting, I know we have a full I, agenda. I have an update on that, actually. That's excellent because this is a, this is a really important thing. There's a serious, couple of serious safety issues going on here that have to be addressed and that can be done without a million dollars. You know, one of those that can be done. But we could talk more about it later. I just, I needed to bring it up because I was absent last time. And, 
wanted to be sure that, if possible, we talk about it today. Thanks, John. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Vanessa. I think I've been to about eight or nine town related events or meetings since our, since we last met, but in, bearing in mind uh, Vanessa's plea for brevity and efficiency, I will uh, speak to two of them. Uh, I, I attended a Reading Cultural Council meeting and they're in the process of reviewing applicants for, um, for awards for our local arts organizations and uh, they are looking for new members. So if anyone is interested in volunteering your time for our community in a group of really wonderful people doing a really rewarding task, which is looking to support our local uh, artists, musicians, veterans, um, this is a great, a great opportunity and I would encourage you to apply. Um, yesterday morning, uh, John and I attended um, an event put on by the Reading North Reading Chamber of Commerce, which was really wonderful. They put on a, an award ceremony for first responders. Um, there were there was a recipient from each of our public safety departments, um, from our, from our fire department. Uh, John Keel was was recognized. From our police department, Michael Fitzgerald was recognized, and from um, our dispatcher department, Debbie Haynes was recognized and. Uh, they were each nominated by their colleagues in their respective departments, and it was um, an excellent event. John, I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to uh, say. Just other than the fact I haven't lost my touch with babies because I was <laughs> able to take over young Charlie and hang out with him. <laughs> <laughs> I was still good at it. <laughs> um, very true. Uh, so that's, that's what I have. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll start with recreation. Um, after our meeting, um, a message was sent out actually by our recreation administrator um, giving us an update um, that she and actually the town staff have been working with the contractor um, to get some estimates on improve various improvements to the three softball fields. Um, and so they're in the process of receiving bids um, and evaluating some of the safety concerns. So they actually have already been working on this for several months. Um, and so that is in fact in progress. So I thought that would alleviate your concerns. Um, so my thanks to Jenna and Recreation for being on top of that. Um, uh, I'll echo what Andy had said, which is that, um, and I know Bob, you'll be giving an update, but we've been hearing from several of the neighbors um, in the Lincoln Prescott area regarding the development there. Um, and lastly, we can touch this on this subject later on. Um, but if you're following social media at all, um, there has been um, an effort to have trick-or-treating moved to Saturday due to what is expected to be heavy rains and um, strong winds on Thursday. Um, so I'm going to slide this under the 48 hours notice since we haven't been able to put it on the agenda officially. Um, there are a few towns in the state and numerous in New Hampshire who have already postponed it to Saturday. So we can tackle that at the end of our meeting, but just wanted to put it on the radar. Um, all right, I will hand it over to Bob. Okay, thank Town you. Manager of Bob. At your last meeting, there was some a brief discussion about the no idling law. So we thought the best start was to put something out on social media. And uh, sure enough, um, within just a few days, we reached a total of 1,852 people have seen it. So you know, if you've seen the post, you've seen there's a lot of comments. Some people like it, some people don't. But the point was, we got the word out uh, pretty effectively in a, in, a short, in a short amount of time. Um, in terms of Lincoln Prescott, I do have a uh, statement that uh, Assistant Town Manager Jean Delios wrote. She's going to be here tonight. She actually was, uh, she took me there yesterday for a brief visit. She had a site visit with some residents today with all three of the developers. Um, and let me just read to you uh, what she wrote. Uh, the issues, in my opinion, being raised are distilled down to three concerns as follows. Uh, pedestrian egress path is one, landscaping is another, and lighting is the third. And I'll just go over each one what she's written. The pedestrian egress path was required by their code reviewer. I have asked for further details so I have the technical facts of how this is now considered a life safety requirement of the project. So in other words, we didn't impose this. They had a code review that said you must do this, and we don't have the technical details yet. Uh, because of the podium style construction, it is a bit more complicated and technical, and I'll await those details before commenting further. So I saw that specifically yesterday, and I certainly had some concerns that it was much of an egress path because at least half of the path 
and would likely be overlapped by front bumpers of cars, the way they've set it up. But again, we'll circle back to that when she has some technical facts. Uh, landscaping. The pedestrian egress path was installed at the western end of the Prescott Streets facade in place of landscape and landscaping. The developer has agreed to provide screening, an eight-foot uh, vinyl fence, as well as additional landscaping to mitigate the impact and to address neighbors' concern. I'm awaiting the details of what he is discussing. And lastly, lighting. This has also been presented as a garage safety issue to the town staff from the developer. Again, because this is podium construction, it is more complex than other kinds of lighting. I've requested a photometric plan to verify the conditions and document any presence of light spillage. So again, these three areas are something that was done outside of the guidelines given to them by the town, and they are falling behind uh, the umbrella, if you will, of safety, and they will then have to prove that to us, and they will bring, be bringing documents forward to us. And just to conclude, uh, they are operating under a temporary certificate of occupancy. They have not got a full ter a certificate of occupancy, and they will not get that until the building inspector is fully satisfied with all these and many other highly technical areas. So, uh, before you move on, Bob, do, do you have any other questions? Yeah, just a, a couple questions. I mean, this is not the first time where. Um, the Met has um, not adhered to uh, the plan. And um, so if I heard, did I hear you correctly that a, a, a landscape, a, an a area that was on the plan to be landscaped was not, is, has been paved over? Right. I didn't, yeah. Um, and so, so that's, they're not in compliance with that. But, but again, they've argued that safety is the reason they've changed from the plan, yeah. so we need to hear back and, and understand that. Okay. And um, they, they put up, the sign that they put up, Jean, Jean said was not in compliance with our, um, um, with our bylaws and had them taken down. It, 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 at what point, um, do, does the board get more involved or the, the town start to um, fine for um, violations, in this case, of the, of the signage bylaw? Right now, we have no legal ability to fine them because they're claiming public safety improvements that were required of them, so we have to get to the bottom of that. With this, was the sign part of the safety improvements? I think they took that down as soon as being told them, so. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, have other members of the board um, been hearing from residents? I know Andy and I have. Obviously. I have. You have? I definitely have okay. had a long, ongoing okay. um, number of emails that have come to me directly, okay. and not necessarily through the. Uh, I think we're all in the same boat, and, and we might be hearing from the same people just um, separately. Bob, recently, in recent um, weeks, I've only heard from the both emailed the board jointly, but okay. I've previously heard from other residents. Okay. Well, can I ask, uh, to, uh, under normal circumstances, we would sort of hand this off to the staff, and, but given the volume that we're all getting independently, can I ask you to give us regular updates for the status sure. of these projects? Because we, because we can't talk about this offline, we don't know who's responding and who's questioning us to begin with. So if we're all informed, I think we'll be able to communicate better with everyone who's reaching out to us. And, and I would ask you, obviously, we <coughs> see the emails to the whole board, as you all do, but we don't see anything else, so we don't necessarily know who was talking to you. So right. I know it has happened that the same resident that might have talked to you individually offline has also talked to us, right. and it'd be helpful if we're all telling you kind of the same thing. Right. So and, to and that end, what I've done is when I've gotten those emails, I'll, <coughs> I send my request for information along with the email that I got so that you know Bob knows or Gene knows or both actually yeah. are aware of who's corresponding with me, so there's so there's a central place for at least who's corresponding with me, so. Um, yeah, I mean, I think generally most of us do that, depending on the type of communication that we're receiving. But Bob, if you can keep us all yeah. equally in the loop on this one, um, and just be cognizant of the fact that you cannot reply all to anything. If you have right. questions, direct them, please, right. um, yeah. to Bob or and Jean alone. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, town meeting members. This attractive town meeting warrant report is now available. It's seasonally colored. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, town meeting begins on Tuesday, which is unusual, but it's Tuesday, November 12th, the day after Veterans Day on Monday. 
Um, I want to thank the Killam second graders who came down today. They, they walk down almost every year from Killam and think about the distance. They walk down to see Town Hall, RCTV, the fire department, and the police department. Usually Town Hall comes in fourth when they vote, but I haven't heard the results of today's vote. Uh, but I have to tell you, the, the kids are terrific. Um, they say things and ask you questions that you couldn't possibly prepare for. And I'll show you an interesting thing that happened just before they turned the corner, which I really Oh boy, it's hard to it's hard to imagine, Bill. But right up on top of the oh, light, right that. outside Town Hall, this guy started looking for them. It was the weirdest thing. For those of you that don't know, that's our newfound celebrity, our turkey, right up there. And the kids were fascinated because most of them saw him in person on their trip, so that was all they wanted. To <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I have. You've mentioned some of the other things. Thank you. Great, thanks, Bob. Um, so next up we have public comment. Um, before we get started, by show of hands, can I see how many people would like to speak for public comment? Do you need this? Okay. Copy Thank you. Uh, so a couple things before we get started. Um, please raise your hand, provide your name and address for the record. Um, I'd like to ask if you can keep your comments to subjects under the purview of this board. Uh, please no derogatory or campaign related comments and depending on what you'd like to talk about you're welcome to speak now um, if there's a particular topic on the agenda that you'd like to speak about you're welcome to stay and raise your hand when that topic has come up in front of the board um, it's up to you whether you want to stay or go um, with that in mind um, Bill uh, John that's they used to have systems around town but they dumped those things. oh is that what it was yeah there was probably 25 to 30, and every time town, uh, town employees don't, can't find they call them. Uh, they have found quite a few of them in town. The other thing that you're talking about is moving Halloween. Quite frankly, I don't think it's the purview of the Board of Select when you get into certain social issues. Uh, think back in history. Uh, in the 1930s, there was a gentleman that got involved in social issues, and I don't want to see us go down that road. Thank you, Bill. Interesting. Can we uh, Eric Bamer, uh, 276 Woburn Street, directly across the street from the fire station there, so I'll look for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, my son, who is very much into firefighters, uh, even at 16, would uh, certainly like to see that. Um, I am the uh, person who wrote the letter. Um, I'm sure you all got the letter about uh, the softball fields uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I had sent it uh, to as many people in town as I could <laughs> as I could get to, uh, including rec committee, school committee, and everyone. So basically here now as a follow-up, and it sounds like you, you have some follow-up there as well, and I think some other people would like to speak in public comment also about it. Um, as of right now, for in the time that I sent the letter out, I have only really heard directly from Tom Zaya at the high school, and he gave me his background with regards specifically to the high school. And the other uh, comment I got uh, was and uh, was copied from was from Dr. Doherty, who uh, copied um, uh, Chuck Robinson on it, and it was basically an explanation that. It's not our purview. It's in the direct committee, which uh, is understandable and, um, from from what I understand. So I, I focus primarily on the immediate safety issues of uh, what outlined this letter and the two main things: the field itself and the structural of that particular compartment right there. Um, and it sounds like it's part of an overall master plan that rec committee, uh, I, I, just in speaking to people, there sounds like there's a plan here and there, and I'm a little bit like, okay, can we focus on this one main field that gets a lot of primary use, and focus on, uh, it, what is it, probably a quarter, a, a three quarters of an acre of area that we're talking about. I don't know that it would necessarily impact the overall plan if it causes an overlap in delays, I, I think that that would be concerning, especially for the high school team and, and everyone else. So that's 
where I'm coming from on it, on the, and it sounds like, again, that you have uh, some update on it. I, I'd be curious to hear from the rec committee and talking to a few people. Uh, oh, who's on this committee? What, you know, what's, you know, what did, what did they do? What's it entailed? And I'm like, I don't know. I, you know, I, I'm hearing this on, on behalf of other people as a kind of, the letter has, you know, set it off. Mm -hmm. so. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Audrey Cashin from Six Virginia Road, and um, I have four daughters going through the Reading Public Schools, and my eldest daughter played the song bottle for the high school last year. So again, and safety, of course, is an um, important issue, but I also want to make sure that we're paying attention to the equity between girls and boys sports, and I hope that that is always on our minds as we move forward. Equity needs to be there. Thank you. Uh, Jimmy Brown, 128 Bancroft Ave. Um, so, lots of things I was thinking about wanting to say tonight, but uh, I can't stress enough that we're talking about 10 feet of fence. It's the only field in the town that does not have foul ball protection. I mean, it's a, financially speaking, if something gets hurt, it's going to be a liability for the town because it's gross negligence. Every other field has protection, this field doesn't. There was two incidents last year during varsity sports. Uh, one in North Reading, a girl took a Ryan Bible off her forearm, protecting her face. Happens to be a family I know in North Reading, and they were silent. And then when we were playing Wuben, another near miss. So just think of what's gonna happen if a girl takes a, we're talking about high school girls. These are some, some of these girls are 18 years old, using, you know, the bats are like tennis rackets. You know, so a girl takes a line grab in the face. Permanent damage can be done. I mean, it, it's ridiculous that we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars 200 yards away, but we don't have fencing to protect our children. All right? I, I, and then I hear you say it's under, you know, there's bids out, there's this, there's that. Winter's coming, spring is right around the corner. All right? I, I don't know if any of the families here, their daughter played field hockey this year and was a senior and lost their whole senior year on their varsity field. You know, that's the potential you're talking about because we're going to drag our feet about three, four, maybe five thousand dollars. We're doing unbelievable. You don't even have to do that. But it's under, I, to me, and I know the girls that are going to be seniors this year, but that field should not be played on until someone puts a fence up. All right? And that's a shitty alternative. All right? That we take a field away from those girls. But if somebody, my daughter broke her nose playing softball two years ago. I know what it's about. You know what I mean? I was in Mass I and and all that stuff. Some girl gets hurt down there, it's, it's gonna be real ugly. Thank you. Jody Cerrone, 49 Victoria Ave in Reading. I have three girls all through the Reading Public School System, three girls that all play sports for the town of Reading. And I have to say, it's a sad, sad field. And it's very sad to look over at the baseball field and compare that to the varsity softball field. In a town like Reading, you shouldn't see that. We shouldn't have other towns coming here, looking over at that baseball field and seeing our girls at the softball field. Like Mr. Burnham said, safety-wise, I can't even believe we let our kids go out there and play on this field. We tell them they have to wear a helmet when they ride their bike, but we let them get out there and play without protection on those benches. It's really sad. It's really sad. So. I'm happy to hear that there is, is something on the rec department in their plan. I'm really sad that it's taken this long. And thankfully, up to this point, I don't think anybody's got gotten injured that we had to hear about it. But like Mr. Burnham said, it's coming. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? Hi. John Means, uh, 19 Cape Cod Ave. And I actually run a business in town, a business for computers and IT consulting business. I'm here on behalf of the Reading North Reading Chamber. I'm actually on the board of directors as well. And just wanted to make a statement about the possible increase in the split tax rate from the businesses to the residents. And why I believe right now it's not in the best interest of the town, the businesses, the residents. This will actually play into a little bit of what you guys are talking about. 
Reading is a great town. I actually grew up in Stone. Born and raised, love it. Now I'm in Reading, I'm on rival. My dad wasn't too happy about that, but just it is what it is. <laughs> and you know, growing up right next to right next door to Reading, I always knew Reading was a great town. It was off. You know, I'd come from Stoneham and look at Reading and be like, wow, what Reading has. And I will say I've been here since 2005 with my uh, now wife, she was a girlfriend at the time. Uh, we have two young children. Uh, my son is seven, he is in uh, Barrows, and my daughter is three in preschool right now. And one thing I see happening to Reading right now is a bit of a revival. I feel like Reading was always really good and a great place. It started to have some trouble, as many towns did, especially during the recession. Cuts and so forth had to take place. And of course, and that's what happens. Ready to have since turned over a lot. As I look at the board now, big turnover. And in my eyes, positive. Um, I've tried to bring a different type of uh, view to the board, and I'd also like to point out Lisa Egan, who's uh, I was the executive director, and I think she's done a fabulous job of really diversifying the board, giving us different opinions. I do believe the school, the town is built up from the schools. Schools and safeties of children, that's where the strength of the town is. But you really can't get there unless everybody's in it together, including the businesses. And the businesses really do try to put back into the town. They contribute with various <coughs> things from contributing to the tree lighting, to the fall fair, Sponsoring teams. I sponsored my son's little team. You know, things like that, we give back. Right now, we're at a crossroads because Reading is expanding. And we're finally getting to a point that we can expand our business commercial base. These new 40R buildings coming up. The talk of the new project down behind the town works. There's a great opportunity here to really build up our business community that will in turn <coughs> turn back and give to the town. But one of the main things we have going for us is our low tax rate for businesses, even as it is right now. I know we did do a split last year, but thank you guys, you kept it at a minimum. And a lot of the businesses are very grateful for that. But I don't think right now is the time to raise it more. Because we have empty stores. We have stores that need to be filled. We have commercial property that needs to be filled. We all know what's gonna end up happening. Those taxes go up, property goes, property value taxes go up, it's harder to fill the spaces, the spaces that are filled have to raise their prices, and that affects businesses that would then in turn and probably give money to help out these I mean, that's awful that the softball girl team is dealing with something like that, it's horrible. But what if we had a very inclusive town? That we could even go to businesses and say, hey, is there a fencing business in town? You guys want to donate a 10-foot piece of fence? You never know. It probably would. And knowing that what you guys are talking about. That's why I think it's we're, we're at a time now that it's not time to divide. It's time to unite. Citizens and businesses. The town of Reading is known as a village. Well, we all know it takes a village to make things move forward. So on behalf of the Reading North Reading Chamber of Commerce, that is what I'd like to make as a statement for that. And I really hope you guys are understanding of that because I think this is a town that is a great place to be. I want to continue to see that all the way through for my kids graduating high school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? I, I have a comment about the split tax rate, but should I hold it until we get to that agenda item? Would that be most beneficial? Uh, well, it's next up on the agenda, so you're welcome to do either. Okay. Well, I feel like, do you want to address softball, or should I jump in now? Um, so technically, as items are not on the agenda, the board cannot speak to them. We can provide factual oh, okay. information, but we as a board cannot opine. Um, so. Okay. Right. Well. Thank you. I just wanted to That's just for informational knowledge as to why we didn't just comment specifically on, on softball. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to um, reiterate John's point. I appreciate it. John put together a petition that I emailed today that had 42 signatures yeah. on it and a lot of comments from local business owners. 16 good ones. 
Pardon me? 16 good comments. 16 good comments. <laughs> Read them all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I think the, the um, tone and sentiment was contained therein, but I do think that it's great to see commercial development in town, as much as I know construction is disruptive and confusing and sometimes there's challenges. I think it's very important for the town to grow its commercial base because the tax burden is so heavily on residential. Um, I think to give up a competitive advantage, which is a lower tax rate than Wakefield, than Wilmington, than Stoneham, than Melrose, and many of the other surrounding bedroom communities, similar to ours that have train stations and have good schools and are, are near Boston. Um, I think to get rid of our lower uh, tax rate is missing a huge opportunity. We've got all of these buildings in process and we need to fill them up and not have a bunch of continual empty storefronts. I think that we should maintain it for now. I don't think it's good timing. Let's let those businesses get in and flourish and use it uh, to our advantage, actually point it out as a reason to come and open their business in Main Street Reading versus Wakefield, Stoneham, et cetera. So I just wanted to point that out and I appreciate your consideration on that. Thank you. Could you just Lisa to introduce yourself for the record? Oh, Lisa, could you introduce yourself for the record? Oh, I'm please? sorry. Lisa Egan, Eight Oak Creek Road, also with the chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Good catch. Thank you. Any other public comment? All right. Uh, Can I just say one of those, you know, how factual things, not opines? This is real quick. Uh -huh. uh, breaking news. Yes. I found out tonight, and I'm saying this for the benefit of those people that are here to speak about the softball. Um, I've made a recommendation that we could use the revolving fund. We've discovered that that is accessible for such a project, which is an important fact, uh, particularly given the timing that we've raised here. So. Um, uh, that's fine. I will leave that in the, that decision making in the hands of recreation and Jenna, our recreation administrator, to determine the financial allocation for that. Um, with that, Mark, if you could open the hearing for us. Absolutely. To the inhabitants of the town of Reading, notice is hereby given that a public hearing will be held in accordance with the Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 369 of the Acts of 1982 on the issue of determining a residential factor in assessing the percentage of tax burden to be borne by each class of property for fiscal year 2020. The hearing will be held on Tuesday, October 29th, 2019 at 7.30 p.m. in the Select Board Meeting Room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading. The five classes of property involved are residential, open space, commercial, industrial, and personal property. A copy of the proposed document regarding this topic will be available in the select board packet made public on Thursday, October 24th, 2019 on the website at www.readingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 12 p.m. on October 29th, 2019 to townmanager at ci.reading.ma.us by order of Robert W. LaSure, town manager. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so before we hand it over, okay. Um, before we hand it over um, to our tax assessor, <coughs> excuse me, tax assessor, um, I'd like to ask the board if you could hold your questions until he has completed the presentation, uh, and then we can ask him questions. We'll uh, open it up to any public comment. If there's any additional, um, we'll then close the hearing and go into discussion on the tax rate. Bob, did you have a um, just a challenge for the board. Uh, last night, um, Wakefield set their tax rate, and as many of you know, Victor is the shared assessor between both towns. And their town council, CIL, took almost an hour and a half to do it. So this is the first time in decades that Reading has an opportunity to do it more efficiently. <laughs> Local town government goals. Okay. Complet has been thrown. Exactly. <laughs> Victor, we'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight, and thank you for all the uh, emails and questions you had leading up to tonight uh, that will hopefully you know, get us to a nice, easy classification. Uh, let's see. So, the required actions by the select board is the selection of a minimum residential factor, selection of a discount for open space that we don't do, granting of a residential exemption that we don't do, and granting of a small commercial exemption, that we haven't done, and separate from the requirements of classification, locally determining the Reading Senior Circuit Breaker Tax uh, Relief Level. 
minimum residential factor. Typically, Reading uh, was a single tax rate community. A minimum residential factor of one would yield a single tax rate, which is the tax levy divided by the total value of the town. Yields our estimated tax rate of 1393. Now we go into some senior circuit breaker details because this is money I have to shift within the residential tax base that will impact the tax rates we're going to discuss based on whatever fact you select. Uh, this year, 186 seniors applied, 182 were approved. Typically those that uh, are not approved is because of the way the ownership of their homes happen to be structured. They may be uh, in an irrevocable trust, they don't have life estate, things of that nature. Total amount of the circuit breaker credits received by the 182 seniors was $172,939. Your available options um, are anywhere from one half up to double the credit. Based on prior discussions and prior decisions of what I tailored the demonstration uh, the presentation, at one and a half times tax relief. So, hey, wait a second here. I have a typo. All right, let me exactly. Someone fidgeting with this. Uh, so we take the total amount of the credit, uh, multiply it by 1.5. I know this number is correct, 259,409, because that's what I shifted and worked with within the tax base. Uh, if you did that, the um, residential tax rate would be 1396, and at a shift of 1.02, which is what the board did last year, the commercial rate would be 1421. Without a shift, the residential tax rate would be 1399 and 1393. But again, we'll talk more about it as I discuss the factors going through. The average single family home value for 2020 is 627,100. And the table below shows various options you have at 1% intervals from no shift up to a 10% shift. And again, at 1.02, uh, this would be our minimum residential factor. You see the residential tax rate at 1396 and an estimated uh, tax bill of $8,754 for the average single family tax bill in Reading. And this is just a list of the average single family tax bill changes um, from 2007 to our 2020 estimates that we have. Um, the total amount of debt exclusion for fiscal year 2020 is almost 2.9 million. This adds 53 cents to the residential tax rate, or $332 to the average single family home, and keeping it at a single tax rate for this discussion, $922 to the average commercial property. Sales activity. Uh, it looks like I'm way behind here, but actually sales for calendar year 2018 were used to determine the assessments you're gonna see in your tax bills coming up in December. Similarly, last year's tax bills used sales from 2017. We had a little dip in the number of sales. Um, days on market went up a couple of days, but the average sale price went from 633 to 656 in one year. The average commercial property value slightly over a million seven, and again at a um, at no shift, the tax rate will be 1393, and the tax bill estimated will be 23780. At 1.02, again, what was done last year, um, the tax rate would be 1421, and the tax bill would be 24256. Now, because of discussions relative to commercial values, the that average value just takes the average of the whole class. Um, but what we tried to show is the impact on those smaller commercial buildings with this slide at various shift options. Uh, the median commercial property valuation for your lowered property values, values under, say, 1.5 million, comes out to 728,000 roughly. 
and at a tax rate of 1421, the estimated tax bill will be 10,343 versus 10,140 with no shift. And this just summarizes the uh, number of properties by valuation intervals. So, you know, six properties above 10 million, 23 from uh, two to 10, 37 from one to two million, 55 from 500 to a million, and 71 under 500,000. And this is a list, again, like the residential properties, uh, the average commercial tax bill over the past seven years. <clears throat> Another point we have to discuss is the discount for open space. Uh, Mass General Law Chapter 59 has a very narrow definition of open space. Land which is not otherwise classified and which is not taxable under provisions of Chapter 61A or 61B. What does that mean? They're not farms or golf courses, pretty much. Um, or taxable under a permanent conservation restriction. Um, and it's not held for the production of income. Uh, an exemption of up to 25% could be adopted. Uh, no properties fitting this, this description have been brought to my attention, and this is something that I wouldn't recommend we do. Residential exemption. Select board may adopt a residential exemption for residential properties only that are owner occupied. Uh, an amount of up to 35% of the average assessed value of all residential properties, including like in vacant land, is used in the calculation. Adopting this would raise the residential tax rate uh, to $20.50 from the, I don't know what I was thinking here. That should be. Uh, uh, $15.93. This would apply to all residential properties before the exemption, and the estimated break-even point is over $680,400. So if you did this exemption, homes valued at $680,400 and above pay for the exemption for everybody else in town. Simply in a town like Reading, that's largely a single-family bedroom community, it creates a lot of class warfare. I worked in Chelsea, where we do have, where we do have a residential exemption, the reason it's successful there is because of the significant amount of residential property that is investor occupied. Mm -hmm. So those investors, uh, while everyone else is paying the high rate, they're funding for the exemptions for people like me who used to live there. In only 13 communities in the Commonwealth have adopted it, uh, and it's only a shift in the residential class again, only higher value homes will pay for it. Small commercial exemption, up to 10% of the property value for commercial properties only, no industrial or personal. Total property value of less than a million dollars. Not more than 10 employees as certified by the Department of Employment and Training. One business in a building of several would qualify only if every other business qualified. Exemption goes to the real estate owner and not the business owner. Um, there's... <coughs> My estimate would be there's only a handful of small business owners that actually own their building. And to less than a dozen communities in the Commonwealth have adopted this, in, in my estimation, it's such a narrow and targeted, there's not a widespread benefit uh, to the commercial class. In fact, it's a shift within the commercial class so the other commercial property owners pay for an exemption that ostensibly goes to the property owner and not the business owner. Neighboring community info, um, just where Reading stacked up for fiscal year 2019, obviously there's 2020 numbers have not set yet. But over here you see the average tax bill last year, uh, the rates, and the last column uh, tells you where each community has shifted. And it looks like everybody that could go to 1.75 goes to 1.75. Winfield goes to 1.24. Nothing in North Reading, a slight shift in Reading. What did Winfield decide to do? 175. I don't even what they do. I'm just going to ask a question on a number in the previous table. Mm -hmm. what? Hold on. Andy, if you don't mind holding your question. Well, is that 1.5 correct for North Reading so that they have a 1.5? 
maximum shift. Oh, the maximum they shift, and it's only one. No Sorry. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Thank you. Um, again, one of these spreadsheets I kind of inherited from the board a millennia ago that compares Reading to these communities, so that you have that for your info. And then I guess I think uh, it keeps getting better. Middlesex League, again, same kind of comparisons we made in the previous slide. And then, largely residential, comparable. It's fun looking all this stuff up uh, for all these communities. <laughs> um, let's see. And this, this is a view. I'm sorry you can't read it. That's as much as I could fit on one page that has everybody else that was supposed to be in all the other slides but couldn't fit. And again, the same type, type of data, the average single family value, uh, the shift rates, tax rates, and the average tax bills. That's all I have, and I'd be happy to answer any questions from the board. Thank you. Questions from the board? I have some. Sure. <laughs> Here we go. Yep. Um, so, uh, just so that I'm clear, the senior tax relief costs three cents per thousand. That's what I think I saw you say early. At a one, no, it would be. Let's see here. Because you were showing rates that yep. jump from 1393 right to 1396. It would be six cents without okay. it. And I think that's, I just wanted to clarify that. I think it's really important for people to realize that that benefit is really important to the people that are getting it. Mm -hmm. And the cost of that is like, it's not even a rounding error. And I think that that's really important. It's always good to be able to look at these things. You do a great job, Victor. Thank you. Of, you know, there's lots of different things you could look at. Um, when I when I was reading this, I I thought I'd lost my mind on that little typo that was in there, but I figured we'd get around to that. You know, um, we did. Um, so I have another question about the commercial properties. So it looks like we've got um, 126 properties. That are worth less than a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Which slide are you looking at? Um, Here we go. Well, yeah, it's that one there. I've just done a little taking it apart. So, <clears throat> and so I guess it's important for me because I think it's important for the, some of the small businesses that actually own property who are also the business being conducted inside that property. And I realize it's not a lot, um, but it's could be meaningful to them, you know, I guess is where I'm coming from. And it seems like we've got almost two to one the amount of commercial property is worth a million dollars or less, which are those properties which could come into the qualification discussion. I'll give you another number that will be a bit mind-blowing. Approximately 80% of the commercial valuation exist solely along Walker's Brook Drive. Oh, I don't doubt that for a second. I wish that we could tax Walker Book, Walker's Brook Drive with a exactly. different split from Main Street and Haven Street, but you know, sadly we can't do that. Uh, you know, um, and, and I'm sure you don't hear from the attorneys on uh, Haven Street and Main Street like you do from Walker's Brook when it comes to assessment time. I had one today, one word answer, withdraw. Very short. Do we have? Thank you, John. Do we have more questions for Victor? Um, yeah, Victor. Just a, a comment, or let me know if I'm correct on this observation. So, in that table that you, that you're looking at there, um, the the um, shows that um, the the number of buildings that are. Um, businesses that are valued at less than a million dollars. And then um, some uh, some buildings greater than $10 million. So I think that um, the when you present the average tax bill, for instance, in the next slide, for commercial properties, um, the, the average commercial value is much higher 
than the average residential value. So just, you know, I warn people against making a, a strict comparison between the average commercial tax bill for commercial industrial and the average tax bill for residential, which is, is much lower. You bring up a great point, Andy, which is why we want the median value of the lower priced properties yeah. in the uh, next slide to add yes. better perspective. And that was a result of discussions we've had at prior yeah. classifications. Yeah, yeah. Um, I found the slide very helpful. So I have another question. On the debt exclusion slide, mm -hmm. um, that's 53 cents that's being added for the debt exclusion. Yep. Um, so I have two questions here. First one is, I'm guessing that the debt exclusion staggers. In other words, it's not like we wake up on in 2022 and it's gone. It, it, it's streamed actually, off. Is that correct? It's actually close to that. Is that right? I know that that's a time when some of them get yeah, well, once the high schools, about half that's the high school, about half that's the library. Uh, high school finishes one year earlier, so that gets cut in half, and then the next year it completely goes away. And it is about that time, right? 2023-4. Okay, so, so it's not too far. So that's encouraging, but we're going to see that go away. Um, the second part of that question is, why is it that um, when we have such a minuscule split that there's such a disparity in the, those two bills? Well, I had uh, mentioned, and I should have made it clear in the slide, this is based on the single tax rate. So if there was a shift of 1.02, obviously the single family uh, bill would go up by a little bit less and the commercial would go up by a little bit more. Can I just add to that, tell John, the average commercial property value is almost three times that of the average single family home. Yeah, but the problem with that, as I think Andy was driving at, and I think that's why you came up with the mean number instead of the average number, is that you, know, you could take a building on Main Street that has a value of, we'll say, half a million dollars. It fits into an average of a $10 million, and that's what drives that thing. Yeah. So the average, I, I almost hate to even see those in there anymore because right. it, it, I, I mean, I know you, you've got to use something to illustrate it, but it, it, it's it, not like that. I mean, so you've got a lot of people that yeah. are either owning or working in commercial properties look at that and go, what the hell happened here? You know, um, I, I stick to the unit of measure that's utilized by the state. It's okay. average single family tax bills and average commercial values to be consistent should people decide to look up the Division of Local Services website, all the spreadsheets and nifty info they got there. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have additional questions for Victor? I have one more. Victor, um, the when you talk about commercial values, mm -hmm. property values, those, correct me if I'm wrong, but those are not based in in assessment like we do for residential properties, but it's based in rent? There's several different approaches to value. There's a cost approach that nobody uses because no one can figure out accurate depreciation to come up with an accurate value today. With residential properties, it's a comparable sales approach. Right. I have a few hundred residential sales that I apply, you know, that uh, small sample, I apply to a wider population after they analyzed and move yes. values accordingly within Department of Revenue guidelines. Commercial sales uh, and commercial properties in general are uh, valued using the income approach to value. Every year, the request of commercial property owners, actually everyone that owns a four family and above, we ask for your income and expense detail. And we receive that info and probably get about a 35 to 40% return rate. But my focus is the bigger building, something valued at $30 million. I want to know what you're doing in there. And that combined with established appellate tax board case law gives me a guide when I review that info. Are they telling you the truth? Their expenses could be too high. Their management fees could be too high for what the region calls for. So I go through that and use that information to ultimately render a value. When a commercial sale happens, very rarely are they arms-like transactions. 
whereby commercial property is listed on the open market for a month. People bid on it. People lose the bids. Someone ultimately buys it. And the buyer and seller have no relationship whatsoever. It's a rarity to find that for a commercial sale. Some of the larger buildings are usually bought by REITs. Uh, a bunch of years ago, I think the apartment complex down yeah. on West Street. Archstone. 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 Sold for mm -hmm. 60 million. Right. right. And here's Vic with a like, 32 million dollar assessment and everybody must think I'm dope. But no, when you get through that sale and look at it, the real estate investment trust doesn't buy it like Andy buys a building. Andy buys a building to run it right, motivate profit. They're parking money to prevent losses elsewhere. It's a non arms like transaction as established by the Massachusetts Tax Court. So if I went and raised that value to 60 million, you'd fire me because of the case we'd have pending before the appellate tax board. But what I do is try to get elements from that sale where I may be able to marginally increase value to capture some of that value that's beneath their uh, investment desire, shall mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, the two different approaches to values. Bob? I could also just add that Victor's job is to assess what he sees, not what it could be. So a single family home, his best use is a single family home, but a commercial property could be bought, knocked down, and rebuilt significantly. And he can't assess for what might be. He has to assess for what is. So you will see commercial property sell above assessed value frequently because they're not just going to put back what was there. They're going to replace it with something different. Thank you, Bob. Um, any final questions for Vector before we... I have one more. Yep. I mean, you know, this is their taxes, so I don't want to rush it. I mean, there's a couple of things that I really need to get clear on. So, Victor, could you describe for us, let's assume we had 10 or 15 um, commercial buildings that would qualify under those fairly stringent rules. And I get that they're stringent, and even though we have 120, they would not all qualify. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how other towns do it and how would you approach it? So for example, you came up with a you know kind of a groundbreaking approach to the senior tax relief. This is different because it's already proscribed, I think. Can you talk about that a little bit, please? I when I say the handful of communities that do it, there's I think my slide had ten or twelve out of three hundred and fifty one citizen towns. I think Westford implemented it a couple of years ago with the strong objections of the assessor at that time. And I share those concerns because it's such a narrow, narrow um, approach to tax relief. Had we not moved forward with uh, creating our own senior tax relief program, probably wouldn't be able to do anything other than say double the senior exemption. But wait a second, we already increased it a couple times since I've been here based on our collective recommendations, but I'm only helping 22 people. So it's, you, you want to reach out more, you want to be able to help more people. And I mean, how would I approach it? it this late date, it would be kind of difficult to try to factor into the rate because I'd have to go through uh, a report that we received. The assessors have privileged information from a lot of different sources. This comes to us from the state, and we go through it. Even home-based businesses are listed in that report, so you have to cross out everybody that wouldn't qualify right. and try to come up with people who would maybe qualify. And it's hard to build a standard, in other words. Yeah, and you're going to have to do this every year because every year property value is going to change. So that guy who's valued at, say, 980000 this year might be a million, 1000 next year and wouldn't qualify. So let me stop you and say, what it, it sounds like from what you're saying that, that because you do collect profit and loss data on commercial property, right? Income and expense. Income and expense, not profit and loss. I don't care about the business. No, income and expense, okay? Um, 
maybe those smaller buildings that might otherwise qualify, maybe a better alternative would be for them to work directly with you one-on-one. -on -one. And see, at least I'm, I, I'm asking you, is that something that you're open to? It seems like it might be more productive for all parties for you to work one-on-one -on -one with a small handful instead of go through what you've just described. If anyone has any issues with their assessment, we're more than welcome to stop by our office and we're happy to uh, go out and review the building. There's certain times of year that work better for us and for the taxpayer. Right now is a terrible time because I can't change any values. Everything's submitted to the state. And if I change a value by a penny, we're not going to balance. Right. And we try to get pretty good at that. But this is a looking forward. But looking thing. forward, like uh, they can either file an appeal in January or if they miss that deadline, stop by in the springtime. That's when my assistant is out there looking at properties. That's when I have the flexibility to run out and look at something. I might have your building classified. I might have it very good and it's only average. So it sounds like it's safe to say that somebody that might be watching this or even in this room right now should listen very closely to what you just offered. We're very Which open. One on one yep. working with you. And I think that, that it sounds like to me that would be much more productive than trying to, you know, reinvent um, the wheel, uh, doing it the other way. In the 20 some odd years I've been doing this, I try to pull the curtain back, yeah. be open and inviting and accessible to folks, hear their concerns, figure out what we can try to do, if we can do anything. And if I can't do anything, hopefully they respect that, you know, our hands are tied, it's got yep. to correctly what we have. We always try. Thank you, Mr. It's great offer. Thank you, Mary. Uh, if there are no further questions from the board, we'll open it up in case there's any additional public comment. All right, seeing none, thank you. Uh, why don't we close the hearing and then we'll move on to discussing the tax rate. Move that the select board close the hearing, establishing the fiscal year 2020 tax rate. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Great. Um, so before us tonight, uh, we have to decide go back to the beginning of the, all right. We will be voting on a minimum residential factor, uh, determining if we will offer a discount for open space, which we have not done historically, uh, determine a residential exemption, which we have not done historically, as well as a small commercial exemption, which again, we have not done. Um, and we will be determining the uh, Reading Senior Circuit Breaker Tax Relief. Is there a motion for that? No, we forgot that. So I'll read You'll read it? Okay, perfect. Um, so why don't we start from the top uh, and discuss the minimum residential factor. Who wants to be brave? I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I just wanted to thank Victor for taking the time last week to sit down with me. You when I got there, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I really appreciated your time, which is why I didn't have any additional questions for you this evening. I really appreciated that. Um, in, the, in the months leading up to April of, la of this year, um, I, I, I spoke about um, my willingness to consider in future years um, an increase in um, the minimum that's it, in the split tax rate, but for this coming this year, uh, I believe that I'd like to keep it at the at the uh, current split at 1.02. I think that I, I really appreciated what John had to say tonight about um, kind of coming together as a community, and I do think that uh, our small business community contributes a lot. Um, that they have recently borne. Um, some small burden with the with the with the shift, which I do support, but I'd like to keep it uh, where it is for this year. I would I am open in future years to a conversation about increasing the split, um, but where we are with uh, 40R developments coming in and wanting to fill those spaces and um, you know really wanting to have a a vibrant downtown Haven Street uh, Main Street uh, for this year, I'm comfortable with the 1.02. Thank you. So, um, Victor, thanks, and thanks for your, your our emails back and forth were really helpful. Um, we are, we're blessed with having lots of small businesses. Um, we're cursed 
with having um, a modest number of much larger businesses. And it would be wonderful to allow them to carry more of the load. Um, and we inquired about that a few years ago, I believe, and found that there's not a way to distinguish and have different rates, right? There's one rate. So that's really too bad. That makes it much more difficult for us. As I look at the communities around us, um, and Victor, you went through the list, you know, a lot of the rates are, are 1.25, 1.5, 1.75. That said, the communities that have, let's say, less than 10% commercial properties, um, many of them are, are at even, although you do have Stoneham out there um, that has quite a, quite a shift going on already. In fact, maybe just put the Stoneham one up there for a second if we could. So they're at 1.75, and they're at 9.6% CIP of the total, so, so closer to us than many of the others. Um, so I, I think, Ann, I, I agree to, to some extent with your point. I think we're, we're not ready to, to be shifting to any kind of numbers like this at this time, uh, 1.25, 1.5, 1.75. I think it would behoove the board to consider uh, somewhere between 1.02 and 1.04 as possibilities. I think that I'm, I'm comfortable pretty much anywhere in that range. I think that we do want to encourage our businesses. I think the change from 1.02 to 1.04 on the median bill is about $200. I believe that's right. So yeah, so from 10.3 to 10.5, that's a $200 difference. So I, I would encourage the board to think inside that range. Um, again, I think I'm, I'm, I'm okay at 1.02. I think the reality is that we are going to need a bigger shift as time goes on. Uh, and it's I wonderful. Disagree with that. Yeah. I don't disagree with that. Understood, understood. I think the question is one of timing. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a lot of other property that should be coming on stream soon uh, in the mixed developments. Um, I, I think it's worth having a discussion about somewhere in that 1.02 to 1.04 range. Thank you. And here, John. <coughs> Andy. I'll let you go first. I've spoken a lot. I, you know, I'm All right. happy to defer to you. Sure. Right now. One, one of you speak, please. Okay. <laughs> we could go on like this. I no, we couldn't. No, yeah. <laughs> the, John, the John and Andy show. Um, so I have to be honest with the business community. I promise to be honest when I ran for this position and I've been, this is my third time to this dance. Um, f from all that I understand and have learned, um, it's my belief that a, a, a shift will help in improve the fairness um, in the, in the ta with the tax burden between residents and commercial. I, I won't get into all that now for the sake of time, but I have to be honest, and that is where I see Reading going in the future down the road. Um, I think that, that if you look at the other residential towns, many of them have sp splits of 175, 13, 133, 15, 168, 124, 130, and uh, uh, we're at 1.02. Um, I think that ha is going to have to go up in the future for Reading um, to, uh, to establish greater fairness in the way we tax our residents. Um, that said, I, I've seen a growing uh, what I sense to be a growing distance between the business community and the select board. And um, that is a rift, I think, that, or at least a perceived rift on my part, that should be um, addressed before we take larger steps towards um, a split tax rate. Um, so I would, I would be happy with a, a shift anywhere between 1.02 1, 1 and 1.04, um, with the understanding that um, I think over the long term, Reading's got to um, shift over to what many uh, residential communities do already. Thank you, Andy. John? Yeah. 
Um, this is my sixth dance with Victor. Um, and, I, and I will just, there's a couple of things that are, I think, very important to point out. Um, last year, one of the things that I strongly suggested to this board was that um, there was rezoning that occurred a handful of years ago with the idea that what we see happening would happen, and it has. And one of the ideas behind that was a growth of, in two areas, of more commercial opportunities, more commercial buildings, more build businesses, which of course, if that happens, it changes the valuation of the properties that's been developed or redeveloped. The second piece of that is, by using 40R, what you have is not only additional commercial properties, you also have additional residential properties. And the rezoning was designed so that the current businesses could benefit from the fact that, you know, um, we've got at Postmark 55, we've got um, over where um, EMARC was uh, 50 or 60, over where the Snowco station was 30 or 35. Those, we have to give this time to germinate. I mean, those people aren't living there yet. They aren't able to, you know, to patronize these businesses yet. They will soon enough. More businesses will be there. Um, but as I said last year, the time to split this thing inappropriately is not now. I think you do have to look seriously at it each and every year. I think a movement beyond where it is right now would be highly ill-advised. I would never support it. I would vote strongly against it, any upward movement. As a matter of fact, I would have a hard time voting for 1.02 because, frankly, 1.01 equalizes the commercial rate to the residential rate given that senior discounts have to be paid for. Now, I realize the first time we split it, we drove Victor insane with the amount of decimals we needed to try to, you know, make it as close to equal as possible. That was unfair. Um, but a rounding, you know, to 1.01, .01, in my opinion, would be the right place to go. It would give the germination time, and it would equalize the tax rate between the residential and the commercial. So I, I'm sure from the sounds of everything, no one's going to be jumping on board with me to reduce it to 1.01. .01. Um, but I would hope that all of you would seriously listen to what you heard, um, both in person, what we heard in the way of a petition, the 16 comments that came with that petition, and the fact that we need to give this commercial community the opportunity to grow from what, we've cre what we're creating in the way of residential growth downtown. So I would urge all of you to join me in not letting this go up. Um, as I said, I, I have an extremely difficult time voting for 1.02. If I thought I'd be any help, I'd, I'd ask to move it to one point back to 1.01. .01. So that's how I feel about it. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, all right, I guess it's my turn to weigh in. Um, so. I think one of the things that, that hasn't been mentioned in this discussion is um, how these rates and how the split rate affects residents. Um, because as we look to similar communities and what they do, they have a significantly more split rate um, due to the consideration that commercial properties don't increase in assessed value as rapidly as residential properties do. Um, so I do believe we should be going in that direction with a split tax rate. Um, that said, um, when we voted for the 1.02 last year, um, I did say I thought we should keep it at that rate for a couple of years, and I still hold that to be true this year. Um, so my vote would be to keep it at the 1.02, and next year to revisit it at a different range. Um, uh, and I, one of the other things that I wanted to add is that you know when we talk about supporting local businesses, um, yes, it's about patronizing them. 
and thanking them for the many contributions that they give to our community, but it's also how we as a board and the town support them in other ways. And one of the things that we have on our agenda for the town is parking. Parking is a huge problem for our local businesses. So supporting businesses um, isn't just about the tax rate, it's about what else we as a community are doing to help them thrive. Um, so that's my piece. I vote for 1.02. Yes. Um, so. I think that you're spot on that we need to talk about what we can do to help support the local businesses. I think that the downtown initiative is a good example mm -hmm. of that because it's parking, it's, it's a lot of things. Having more residents downtown will be great, be a great opportunity for downtown merchants. I think it's wonderful. Um, I think we need to even do more than that. And I think it's a, a public-private partnership to do that. Um, I separate that a little bit from the tax rate discussion. Um, I, I don't know why there needs to be specific equity. I think most cities and towns in the Commonwealth don't believe there needs to be equity. So I, I'm not sure exactly where that notion came from other than just historically that's been the case in the town. So um, as I said, I'm, I'm comfortable kind of between that 1.02, 1.04. I do think that we need to be thinking about it carefully. I think that the lag in, in um, how we value it really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And we do have, you know, residents have had a lot of, of increases. We've gone through uh, the override very recently as well. Um, there are going to be other needs that come up. And, and just to be clear, so everyone, I'm sure everyone understands this, but to be sure, changing this here doesn't increase the total revenue that the town brings in. It's the same number. It's yeah. a question of how it's split. So that's what the shift is that we're talking about here. Um, I'd love that we could, we could get more money coming in, but that doesn't seem to be how it's, you know, we're gonna get it done. So I, I think we need to be very cognizant of how we can support our community with people shopping downtown, with people patronizing our merchants, see how the board can help with that, see how town initiatives can help that, um, and at the same time, just make sure that we're we're kind of working with our residents to make sure they're not bearing an unfair burden either. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it seems like the majority of the board, um, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, is comfortable with the 1.02 if it were to remain consistent for this year. Is that fair? Victor has a question. Out. If you were to make that motion, here's the number you have to use. Thank you you would adopt the minimum residential factor of 0 0.9968411, <clears throat> which results in a... 1.02. That was going to be my next question, so thank you. Um, you know, if we go to 1.01, .01, there's less decimals. <laughs> we, we can just add the decimals. That's not a problem. <laughs> So, uh, Andy and Mark, you had both stated the range of 1.02 to 1.04. Are you mm -hmm. comfortable keeping it at the 1.02 for this year? I, I, I will, like I said, I, I worry about the, um, what I perceive as, you know, when in the past few years we've, we've split it, increased the split, or we've created a split and increased it very minimally, and um, businesses get furious with us. And, and I think that, um, that I, I'd like to see us, that, that rift that's created change. Um, and as other people have stated, uh, that will allow us to help businesses in other ways. So um, with that comment, uh, I, I would um, be comfortable with sticking to 1.02 this year. My only hesitation is that I think when we look at it again each year, let's say next year, um, the kind of increase might not be quite as, as, as you know, one or two each time. So I think it's an issue of, you know, do we hold it for this year, which I am comfortable with, but if we look at future years, it may, it may need to change by a larger amount versus kind of changing it a little bit at a time. Noted, and that will be next year's Understood. board discussion. <laughs> As I said, I'm okay with 1.02. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Anything further to add before we read the motion? Can anybody entertain 1.01? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> all 
Okay. Uh, so, Mark, that you read the motion, you have the correct minimum residential factor. Yeah. So, move that the select board adopt a minimum residential factor of 0 0.9984. Four one one for fiscal year twenty twenty. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. All right. Next up, um, we need to determine whether we will grant an open space discount. So again, let's just go around Robin. Andy, are you in favor of this or not? Historically, we have not supported this discount. Um, due to Victor's insight, I am not in favor. Okay. I don't see a need, so no. No. Okay. John? I have no interest. Okay. Uh, can we have a motion then to not grant? Move that the select board not grant an open space discount for fiscal year 2020. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Can you actually have a motion, a negative motion? It's okay. You can. It is okay. All right. Let's check. Uh, all right. And next up, we have the residential exemption, which again, historically, the town has not um, carried. Um, Again, let's just go around Robin, and I'll start with you. John? I have no interest in that. Mark? No. Okay. No. Right. Um, if you can read the motion to not adopt. Move that the select board not adopt a residential exemption for fiscal year 2020. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. All right, and now we have the commercial exemption, which again, the town has historically not provided. Uh, let's do this round robin. Start with you, Mark. Uh, per the discussion from Victor, I don't think this is a good approach to it. I, I would vote no. Okay. I Andy? will vote no. No. Anne? No. John? Um, I think Victor's explanation makes me feel like our, those that would qualify would be better off having an individual discussion with Victor. Um, and I, and for, that, for that reason, I would say I would vote against it. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, Mark, you read move, the motion for not grant. Move that the select board not grant a commercial exemption for fiscal year 2020. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Great. Motion carries. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, move that the select board adopt a factor of, you decide, for senior tax relief, your possibilities at 0 0.50 to 2.0. Uh, the home rule petition has a 1.5 fixed in the future, and that's where you are. Okay, um, so we are currently at 1.5. Um, we haven't talked as much about this recently. We did talk about this, I think, a few months back. Uh, one of the things we found when this was changed um, is that as the rate fluctuates, we risk um, people not being qualified for it from one year to the next. We also create um, so, uh, an unpredictability for seniors' income. Oh, Victor? No, yeah. that's. So, oh, yes. Okay, good. Thumbs up from the from the tax. I was signing okay. her. So, <laughs> um, so um, I generally try and speak last, but my recommendation would be to keep it as is for this year, um, so that we create that predictability and stability for seniors who um, are interested in applying. Other thoughts? Yeah, I think that we really talked about this at length, and mm -hmm. I think Victor's given us some good guidance at 1.5. That's where we've been. We've already made a decision that that's going to be the number going forward, so I, I think we should stay where we are. Okay. I think for seniors in general, there's a more even keel to their circuit breaker and their senior tax relief by doing it this way. It's more predictable. And I think we're helping roughly 180 or so seniors per year with this, and I think that's very good. Yeah, I like that number. Right. Yes. I agree. Right. Uh, so, Bob, let's go with the. So, move we'll that the board adopt a factor of 1.5 for senior tax relief. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Great. Thank you. I don't, yeah, I think oh, we, no. I think so we need right, to redo. Right. Okay. okay. Need to redo. Do move, yeah, so <laughs> move that the select board adopt a senior tax relief factor of 1.50. Now, can I have a second? So I'll second. 
call that as in favor? You mold them, not feeble. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fun times. Good, thank you. Um, so why don't we take a short break, and then next up we will be discussing the select board onboarding manual. Thank you. Before I go, I've been called boring.
come back, next up on the agenda, um, we'll have an update on the select board onboarding manual. All right. Um, Andy? Yes. Um, let me, first of all, give you the, um, the, just remind you with the outline that I presented uh, back in September was and how what I provided you for today's meeting fits into that. Um, the, the onboarding manual outline included um, five sections or six sections and it was uh, a welcome statement. Uh, B, the big parts B and C were to describe the duties, our duties under town charter and our duties under the general bylaws. And then um, describe state training for open meeting law, conflict of interest, highlight critical parts of select board policy. So f the, the, the big chunks are what's in the charter for the board of selectmen as we're known in the charter. And and what's in, what's in the by, what are in the bylaws for the select board, as it's referred to. Before I could do that, I thought it would be helpful for, for me and the board to go through both documents and provide just a quick shot of what article of the um, charter or bylaw says about us, says we're supposed to do or we're, we're responsible for doing. <coughs> and I provided that in, a, I'd like it to go as an appendix to this sort of as a cheat sheet. But f if you folks like it, then I will use it to develop a, a sort of very summarized version in, in for sections uh, B and C, that is, our duties under the town charter and our duties under the general bylaws. So if you look to the table that I sent out, just for people who, who haven't studied this at home, um, it's just, bro I broke it up into categories that I thought made sense, but please give me your opinion. Um, the, the first part is our general duties. Uh, the second part are, um, I'm sorry. I scooted down too fast on the computer. Um, general, general stuff, town elections, town meeting, appointments, uh, which is a long um, part of the table, town manager, our interactions with the town manager, et cetera, um, and licenses. Water and sewer. Policies, I mean, not our policies, but policies that we're responsible for. Um, public order, and I believe. Permits. Permits, permits, fees, and penalties. And then uh, just other power, powers and duties. And the last one is the, the reports, I don't know how to express this, I said receipt of reports and other documents. We're supposed to receive certain things um, from other town entities, and that's listed here. If you can think of a better title, that would be great. So that's, all, that's, that's, all, that's my presentation. I'm really just looking for feedback on the table. Do people think it's helpful? Do you wanna see some changes? Um, and then once I have your approval on that, I, I'll go ahead and, and write the bulk of the onboarding manual. Um, so Andy, congratulations. This is, I think, fantastic. I think it boils it down very well. I'm sure this was a Herculean effort. Really appreciate it. Um, I think structurally, um, it made sense to me and it worked. I had actually three specific questions of what's contained. Mm -hmm. Is that something that I can bring up or do you want to stay yeah. with structure? No, that's fine. So um, under town elections, yep. line 13, referendum petition and special election. Uh, says yes. Says upon receipt of petition for ballot question by more than three. I'm sorry. Uh, three voters? Three percent. 
three percent. Oh, ha. Can't be three hmm. voters. Greater right, than Bill. three voters. <laughs> I apologize. I will correct that now. It's, yeah, it's three percent. Very good. Yeah, I that feel a little bit be, better about that. That would be good. <laughs> good catch. <laughs> nice catch. <laughs> I was a little concerned that maybe I hadn't read things. No, no, you're, you're right. It's three percent of the voters. Um, second, mm -hmm. sometimes there are discussions such as like town council on line 29 under appointments and where it says board may request advice of town council would you put into the manual um, if there's a mechanism for doing certain things or is it really just going to stay very high level just say you know this is a, a power for um, in, in other words this isn't this says it, it's possible it doesn't kind of say how to do it i'm just wondering are we staying at the very high level or would it end up having a little bit more detail and, and right. i'm not sure what the right answer is i just wanted to know which is yeah, actually, you 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 point out there, there's a discrepancy in here with town council because I didn't know where else where else to put this. We are supposed to appoint the town council, but it also says that the board may uh, the town council reports to Bob, the town manager, and um, if the you know the process is if we have a question for town council, one of us, we ask Bob to ask town council because Bob is a supervisor. Um, but as a board, we could also ask town council directly. It's a small point. Um, it has nothing to do with us appointing him. So I probably should take it out and put it someplace else, but I don't know where to put it. When you answered my question, we're gonna stay at the high level and I'm fine with that. I just wanted to clarify that. Yes. So that's fine. And then one other. Uh, I mean, I'll talk about the VASC. Absolutely. Yep, yep. yep. Um, 32, residency required. Yes. Any member of a board, um, is there a distinction between a voting member and a non-voting member, or do we just have members and associate members? It just it says, that's what it says. Directly. Members and associates. Any member of a board, okay. committee, or, or commission, and that would be associate member, I would assume, um, full member, Etc. Non-voting member. They're all me they're all called members, and um, um, I would think that it would have to be a resident because associate members can be elevated to voting members. Yeah. Um, should there be a lack of a quorum, or should they want a full contingent to vote? So if they are not a resident, then by charter they wouldn't be allowed to vote, which defeats the purpose of them being a member. Yeah. Yeah. So. Hence, <laughs> um, to be a member, you have to be a resident. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I had a long conversation with a former select board member or board of selectmen member at the time, Russ Graham, about the history of, of this uh, requirement where the I'm gonna, residents I'm came out of that. But, yeah, so, but that's it. Those are my three. Those are your three. All right. Um, and John, any questions or edits you'd like to make? No. Um, this would be in greater detail than a high level, but when we were having a conversation about the uh, ch changes to the liquor license policy, we mm -hmm. talked about factors to consider and what kind of penalty to uh, impose for a violation yeah. being included as part of uh, an onboarding annual. And uh, if we did give some examples of factors in that conversation, um, and I'm wondering if, if Andy, I, I don't know if that will fit, fit within the structure you envisioned, but that was something we had talked about and something that I had said, well, we can not incorporate it as part of the policy, but I would, I, I would have found it helpful when we were engaging in that conversation to mm -hmm. have some mm -hmm. like, reference uh, for what factors to consider in, in um, in determining the penalties for a violation. So if yeah. we could include that, that would be, I would find that helpful. Well, look, it is under review, though, because at our next meeting, we're going to be looking at some changes to that policy, so. True. So that would be, would we have, would that, we end up with some kind of a dip? As a board, we had previously discussed not kind of being, we were all, we'd all kind of collectively said we were comfortable with it, with not, um, specifying factors for consideration and imposing a violation. I don't know what you mean by that, Anne. Uh, things, you know, we had pre I don't know how to, uh, things like, um, 
just yeah. not being too specific to then limit a future board's actions was the gist of it. Well, ex yes, when it came to penalties and adjudication, but we did, we do have in the current policy recommendations. I think I think there's a disconnect here. Um, I, yes, John, absolutely. There are recommendations for if it's the first, second, or third yes. violation. Yes, yes. Um, I think what Anne is referring to is the factors. So. Is the licensee um, apologetic? Have they taken efforts to correct any policy or behavior issues on their side that might have led to the violation? Things like that. Or so on the so other side, have soft, they blatantly violated? Or did they exactly. blatantly violate yep. and not care, which, which happened is, several years ago? Which we are changing. Yeah. So that that's clear. So, yes. So, but I think it, it's more towards the softer considerations because since this doesn't seem to. Um, happen with some frequency, which is a great thing. Um, it might be nice to have maybe, but if not best practices, just things for the future boards to consider. Sure. I, uh, you know, I think that's very subjective material. I think that's tough to put into print into an onboarding manual. But and I think that's why we have agreed to exclude it from the policy so as not to box in future boards, but there are some things that I mean, let's see what Andy comes up with. He's doing a great job. So well, well I, 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 there, I'd be happy to, um, if people, ha yeah, it doesn't fall under the bylaws, open mean law, uh, select board policy, perhaps, or the rough outline of the year. And I, and I want to keep the onboarding manual somewhat succinct so that it will you know, it's not going to be a huge burden that they, oh, i got to read this thing. I was thing. thinking it was the, the issuance, you could put a note under the issuance of penalties. Um, <coughs> oh, in the table. Probably. In the appendix. So is it fair to say that what you've done, and this is back, this will come back to your point, mm -hmm. Anne. Um, is it fair to say that what you're trying to do is you're trying to take a combination of the charter and the policies. And the bylaws. And the bylaws. Yeah. And turn them into an executive summary that is a lot easier to read. Yes. Okay. I think when you do that, I mean, and, and I think that's actually a really good way to put a kind of a primer together. Yeah. But you've got to give footnotes, like if I want more about the topic you're talking about, Selectman's policy 3.17. They're all right there. I, I get that. What I'm saying is that when you do something, I mean, we're not done. You're not done. No. Um, and I do think that we've got to just bring the reference points back. And I think that would solve the thing that Ann is looking for. And, you know, Mark is saying, let's keep it at the treetop level. I mm -hmm. think that's what you were saying, Mark, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. And Ann is looking for something that. She's recently dealt with as a new as a new member right, of the board. Right. Right. So I hear you. Got to be really clear in this thing where somebody can go do more research. I think. Okay. Um, this is, I think, something where we were even even our revised um, select board policy, which we still have to take up. In we had we had discussed not um, boxing the board in with two. You know, you have to weigh these factors in these particular ways, but. Um, as a, a, a point of reference, we had said, well, let, we, could in, we could incorporate the, those kinds of factors for consideration in the onboarding annual. That was how we had left that conversation. Right. Yep. Um, and, and, uh, and now, when we're talking about the onboarding <laughs> annual. Where's the part where we put them in stocks on the company? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting ready for that. I, so, so here's my opinion, and, and tell me if you disagree, and I'll change it. Um, I, I don't want, that's s sort of, uh, that's the first time I've been on the board for three years or two, two and a half. And that's the first time I've had that sort of dis discussion. And so the, the purpose of the onboarding manual that I had envisioned was, um, I, you know, open your mouth and here's some things that you really have to know from the get-go. Um, and if you want to learn more about it, um, here are places in the bylaws, general bylaws, the charter, our policies, where you, 
can go read up on more detail. But these, you know, just quickly say, these are the things we have to do. Maybe include a little process, I think that's important. Um, but, n but on the things, the major ticket items that s a select board, a new select board member would need to go, I'd be a little worried about putting in our thoughts for future boards on something like the, the alcohol policy. Um, in here um, because that's getting into the weeds a little bit. And I, I want to keep it simple, straightforward. Um, he, here are the, yeah, I'm repeating myself. Does that make we sense? Are, we had kind of kicked the, kicked the conversation over to the onboarding manual, but perhaps it really does more properly belong um, before the board when we're talking about the, the changes to the policy and when we, when we do that here. Yeah, I think so. So, I, I mean, I, I think as I see the onboarding manual, it serves a few different purposes. I mean, first, I love this um, document that you put together um, as an appendix. Yeah. Um, it's easy to read. It hits all the highlight points. Um, so, one, thank you. Um, but two, I, I think as far as the onboarding manual, it's I see it as twofold. One, to help new members get up to speed, but also to help collect some institutional knowledge as board members turn over. And so, yeah. you know, of the five members, only one was here when there had been a previous um, liquor license violation. Yes. So that kind of institutional knowledge and memory is lost. So this might be a way to capture things to inform future boards. They can do with it what they want. Yeah. But the information is there. And it's not and those types of aren't the types of things that would be that we would want to enshrine in policy. So I mean some of it obviously Well that's a matter of opinion. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well we don't want to tell future boards you have to consider X, Y, and Z, right? Because they, that's going to be up to them to decide. Yeah. Um, the penalties are something different. Right, um, or closing the loopholes, which is which is what I think it's fair to show at some point some examples. A board in you know in, in 2004 was faced with this. You know, you just that's you know, always helpful. A case study, I give helpful. Couples, and if they don't have to be ponderous, they just you know mm -hmm. this happened. This was the result. So I think it seems like um, everyone's on board with Andy continuing on yes, with please. this onboarding. Yes, manual. Yes, Bob. I understand this is like a, an appendix and the technical section, but from my perspective, one of the most important things you need to make sure is in here is how to communicate. You don't communicate like normal human beings when you become elected. There's all kinds of ethics and <laughs> open meeting laws. Yeah. So all full there. Like, well. <laughs> yeah, that's that's under section D. Describe required state training, open meeting law, conflict of interest. Yeah. Um, and, and that's technically sitting with me and Anne, so we will yeah. make sure to. But you also have a pretty exhaustive policy, maybe it's going to change, to refer to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think for a new person coming in totally off the street, that's one of the most important things. Before Absolutely. You can talk about anything, you have to know how can you talk. Mm -hmm. So maybe instead of, um, maybe I should change the title of that section, Bob, and other fellow board members, instead of describe requ required state training, which will probably make people wince, um, simply say, uh, uh, um, commun something like um, open meeting law, how to communicate as a new as a select board member, and then um, do another one on conflict of interest. Um, you know, you know, it doesn't all have to be technical. Let it be narrative. Right. right. So no, that, that some paragraphs. Yeah, that would just be the header, and then I'd yeah. put in paragraphs. Yeah. Um, can, so, mm -hmm. can I just, um, we talked also about uh, a calendar at some point. Kind of it's, the, that's in there. That's there. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I mean, that's planned. <laughs> it's planned. Thank you. Actually, it's not so hard to do. We okay. take, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Andy, great. Thank you. We look forward to the next iteration. Great. Lovely. All right. Um, next up, we have um, some updates and some considerations from public safety for pedestrian and traffic safety improvements. So, hello. Hi. Welcome. Thanks. I'll, I'll be 
are you kicking us off? What we are doing and what we're not doing, and later talk about why. Okay. Um, you've noticed there's no public hearings posted. Uh, there will be one vote. We're asking the board, uh, and Anne will have a discussion as to what her role can be in that, and that's on the Haverhill Street issue. Uh -huh. uh, but just broadly, I wanted to describe that there's three issues in front of the board tonight. Um, Ryan Percival, our town engineer, will describe the Haverhill Street situation, the update, and the path forward. And again, that does require, or it suggests that a vote happen. Uh, Julie Mercier will then describe uh, the downtown parking situation. And if you get confused, that's good. That's the point. And we're going to describe that a little bit more. And then I'm going to uh, conclude by sort of wrapping up the discussion that some of you have attended on the road diets. And that will get into some of the other requests that have come through to PTTF and why we think it's a good idea to wait. So any road that basically is near Main Street is going to change massively in its traffic pattern because of the road diets. Thus, there are no public hearings for tonight. We need to see how things play out. I'll, again, I'll circle back to that. But uh, we can start with Brian. Sorry, Brian. So you actually have no slides for me, and that's on purpose. Mm -hmm. no, you to read this report. Lots of documents. The report is very long, so I'll <laughs> I'll uh, I'll go through that. Um, back in August, we hired Greenman Peterson Inc. Um, GPI um, that I'll be referring to them as. Uh, to do a speed study analysis on the corner for Haverhill Street because it was kicked back from the state and we were asked to take the signs down. Mm -hmm. um, so they performed that, but in conjunction with that, we also got a recommendation from the police department to look at the intersection of Franklin and Haverhill Street so we can bind those two together because it was more efficient. So I'll talk about Haverhill Street and then I'll give a brief update on the Franklin Street, Haverhill Street intersection. Um, the Haverhill Street speed study, it really just boils down to what they look at for the study. Um, they take into account uh, crash data. They look at observed speed, which you'll see as the 85th percentile. That's always what everyone talks about, that speed. Um, they look at, um, and they also look at uh, trial runs, which is essentially put someone in the car, drive the speed you feel comfortable at, don't look at the speedometer, and then there's a witness that writes down what that speed is that they travel the quarter at, and they match that up against the observed speed. Uh, and then there's finally the ball bank indicator, which is um, an interesting one that's based on the roll, roll angle of the vehicle, <coughs> the centrifugal force of the car, and the super elevation of the road, and it, it takes into account on the angle of sort of like a, uh, a pendulum when it sits in a, uh, a gauge. Uh, so those are all the, uh, the things that they look at. Breaking it down, the 85th percentile for the observed speed was between 38 miles per hour and 42, with an outlier of 43 on one of the sections. Um, the trial runs were roughly around the same. They, they correlated a little bit. Uh, and the ball bank indicator, there was only one curve that really stuck, uh, stuck out. And that was on, they broke it up into seven different curves. And, the sixth curve, which is in the 40th, uh, 40 mile an hour zone, that has to have less than 12 degrees, and that was over. So, and it only met the 35 mile an hour. So, everything points to, and the recommendation from GPI was to make it a consistent 35 mile an hour all the way through the corridor, um, which would also match up to North Reading and it would be within the limits of what we can reduce down to, so. Um, That's except for the school? So the school zone will sit by itself. It's like a special zone, and that'll be 20 miles an hour. Um, it's very specific. We, we cannot, we have to be lower than the 95th percentile speed, and we cannot be no more lower than seven miles an hour of the 85th percentile, and we're sitting somewhere between three and seven miles an hour of the 35, depending on the range. So they feel comfortable with the 35 miles an hour. They think the state will really look at that. Um, it's very, if, if you really want to read through it, um, yeah. they did a really nice job on, on breaking it down. It seems long, but it's actually short. It's actually not that hard. It's not that bad. It's yeah. not that bad. It's just the data behind that. Um, they did a nice job. I think it, I think it's going to be a very um, good study that's sent to the state. I think it'll be very well received. Um, so there is a process on how we proceed from here. It's 
a little lengthy, and I think it's going to also be lengthy in time on when we get back this from the state. Um, but what it starts off as is you have to, whether they vote or they agree to, um, send a letter into the state. It's <coughs> received from the elected body and holds a little bit more weight. And with that letter also goes the five copies of the speed study, um, which GPI's name's on it. So um, it shows the state that we did perform um, a speed analysis um, to change the regulation on, on Haverhill Street. And they'll get that recommendation. From that point, it goes to Mass DOT District 4. District 4 will review it, see if it's valid. Then they send it to Boston Traffic um, and Safety Section. And after that, they'll review it, and then they'll send it back to the town if it's accepted. From that point, the body will then vote to formally adopt um, the 35 miles an hour. Um, once that's done, then it has to go through a process of sending it off, back off to Mass DOT, and then also to the Registry of Motor Vehicles at the same time, and then it, there's a process at some point uh, the district office gets back to us and says, you can go ahead and put up your signs. So how long that process takes, I don't know. I'm guessing it's a few months. Um, but the first step is, is in front of you, which is to send off the request for the letter for the 35 miles an hour, which I feel comfortable supporting. So uh, in terms of presenting it as an option, I guess the question that we would want to talk about is, do we want to try this approach? as opposed to going through the home rule charter approach and trying to pull back control. So use this as kind of a friendly uh, way to get the change that we're, a change that we're looking for. Um, they're not mutually exclusive. You could do this and then you could also pursue the other, which is meant to be at least discussed as a broader policy concept. I, I do think it's a two-step process. I think you react on this. The work's done, it's ready to go. I mean, I'm looking at the letter to sign. I think, from my perspective, just sign this thing and get it going. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they were able to act quickly to change our 30 mile an hour signs, and you know, possibly we could um, encourage them to work with the same kind of speed. I realize it's government. I I feel comfortable that you'll see it go through quick, at least with the district. Good. Uh, once it gets to the um, uh, traffic and safety section, which is in Boston. Um, it'll take a little bit of time there. Yeah, it should come back. Yeah, and, and I don't think that. I think they, it's a two-step process. I think the other thing is. So I personally think we should do both. Yeah. I agree, John. Yeah. Can I suggest that, however we decide, let's get Senator Lewis, Representatives Haggerty and Jones into the loop with what our approach is, so that they're aware that this is in process, mm -hmm. at least as step one, um, so that they aren't surprised by it. And, and in fact, I'm sure they'd be happy to support it as well with yeah. DOT. Uh, yes. They know. They do know. Okay. I mean, they, I think, they know about this. I was talking to um, um, Brad Jones yesterday morning, and he was kind of wired up to this. He, he okay. Let's just make sure all three of them are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so are we comfortable then with, let me just take a look at that letter. Page 111. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just to, I, I would just like to make um, my fellow board members and members of the public aware that I can um, I can discuss and vote on this matter as a member of the select board on, on whether to request that MassDOT uh, change the speed limit in this particular way. Um, but I am, however, not able to sign a letter as a member of the select board to be sent to MassDOT. So I can vote that we that we send it, but I can't actually <laughs> sign it myself. Okay. Um, because that would be my acting as an agent of the select board before the city. So, so noted. And I might, though I may have the same restrictions. Well, there's three of us left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and I think we're supportive. <laughs> I, I think we're on the same page. And again, I, this isn't the formal vote. This is the request for yeah, this is just a, an informal request if you to the state. You have, the body does have the chance to vote on this form. And after the, we get back to the and, and one option is to uh, you know, vote this letter as written. Uh, another was to delegate it to me, but I think in this case it felt better if it comes mm -hmm. from you, quite honestly. Okay. Um, so clarify for us what you need from us to move this forward. Do you oh. need this board to vote to approve this letter? Um, if you would approve the letter and then 
and then those who can sign it can sign. Okay. Do we have a motion to that effect? No. I'll make one. I wasn't sure what Okay. And I, for one, I also support taking a two-pronged approach that we, that the, the board submit this letter as well as pursuing a home, an avenue for the home rule petition. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Um, so, if you have a. How about we try uh, move that the board uh, sign a letter expressing our support for a change to special speed regulation 933 for Haverhill Street. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Great. Um, um, so, Caitlin will circulate the letter now. Um, Brian, thank you very much. You're welcome. And you had another. I do. Just as an, as an update, um, also I'm the. Uh, get back. Uh, a signal warrant analysis, so a very lengthy term, but yeah. what it boils down to is we looked at uh, Franklin and Haverhill Street, which is uh, stop sign controlled right now, as to see whether or not it fit into the warrant to um, have a signal. And they look at crash data, they look at turning movements, they look at volumes. The long and short of it is, um, we met the warrant for the volume reductions, um, and it's in, it's in the um, report, which that's a lengthy report. Um, but the long and short of it is GPI did say it did justify evaluating whether or not we should put it in the signal. So it did justify a signal, and it, it justified us bit, um, evaluating further um, if the signal would fit there. So when they do the warrant analysis, it's very high level, and they're just checking these boxes off the seat should we even look at it further? And the answer was yes. Uh, so, you know, we can proceed at whatever speed we want for that. But at the same, we don't know. Yeah. Um, we did those two sites at the same time because it was, it was efficient. We were already out there. So um, that's the update on Franklin. Yeah. Do we need their permission to put a, because we can't make that decision in the current state. We're, we have no control over that roadway. And from the standpoint of traffic, that's a Bob only Zer to maintain it and pay for it. To Bob's uh, early, right? To such Bob's, a good deal for us. To Bob's earlier point too, we're not really sure what's going to happen with side streets, side street traffic. Um, when we go through some uh, the road diet, um, so that'd be worth looking at too. Okay. Uh, but this was more meant to be a. But an you know, it, it strikes. It just strikes me that we should go forward and really look at this thing. That is. A train wreck waiting to happen, and at all times. On that. When they go into a full evaluation, it'll be a full-on design roadway. They'll look at uh, right of way, uh, possibly right of way taking. So there's a lot involved with um, signalizing an intersection. And one of the one of the um, options is actually a small roundabout too, <laughs> which is listed in there. I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Um, wow. I said we it. Have a, we I actually have a comment first. Oh, quick. sure. Go ahead. What is the exact process? So we signal that we're interested in pursuing it. Does the town do the study? Do we hire an outsider? Uh, no, well, no, GPI would then... Um, uh, you know, would first get a cost estimate. Right. And, and we'd go... From, from a third party. Day. Maybe yeah, just GPI. See how it fits in the budget. We have money in the budget now, but we need to program it out. Got it. And that would include the discussion of if we need more width, I'll call it for the moment? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that... It obviously, the first phase is the cheap phase. The second phase is the more expensive phase. So I'll look into that further and get costs and Bob and I will work to see whether or not it's in the program now or we have the program now. Thank you. Okay. So, question from the audience before Bill. Uh, Just an observation. In 1930, there was a traffic like moved from Franklin over to uh, Franklin and Hayden Street because of the traffic. So nothing changes except the date and the calendar. <laughs> so you're saying there was a light there? Yes, there was. Okay. Yeah, uh, just uh, a qu question, m maybe a stupid one, but um, why do we need uh, to hire a consultant to prepare information? to install a traffic light at this location. Do we not have the staff, um, the bandwidth, the, so the expertise? Um, we have the expertise. Um, what, things of this nature when you're doing, when you're doing traffic studies, when you're uh -huh. doing signals, they're very specific. Transportation engineers are very specific. There's nuances in turning counts. 
there is um, software that they use that we don't have. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of time and effort that's put into counts and turning movements. Yeah. Um, they're accustomed to the, the rules and regulations. And they're also looking at um, you know, which turns need to be sequenced in a certain way for traffic programming. So it's very, very specific. And this would be something that you generally would um, consult out. Yeah. Just I want to n make sure people understand that when they say, why are we hiring a consultant and for, for this? The, the design, we don't have the, the design phase. There's also like electronic components that um, you'd have to be an electrical engineer and things of that nature. And the consultants have to work right. with those. So that's out of our purview. You know, right. We have to be specific. Right. So we don't have the, the expertise, the, the, the equipment, and really the bandwidth of staff to staff, accomplish I would say this. Staffing, staffing and the bandwidth with the software. Yeah. Okay, thanks. It's well with the consultant. Thanks. All right. Is that it for you? Yes. All right, wonderful. Thanks, Ryan. All right, next up, Bob. Julie. Hello. Bob, is this the one meant to confuse us, or is that later? I'll let you decide. <laughs> so this was in your packet. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Oh, okay. All right, good. So it's even more exciting. Um, so I'm here tonight to talk about the challenges and opportunities of our downtown parking system. Um, tonight's presentation will include an overview of the system and the challenges. The PTTTF's request of the select board, the request that we're making tonight, our guiding philosophy as we approach um, looking into potential opportunities for consideration and further study. Um, so first I want to introduce the cross-disciplinary team that's working on this. Um, a number of them are in the room tonight. You see the representatives from the police department, planning and management, um, engineering, and DPW. So we are working um, as a team and we will come any recommendations we come to you with will be you know based on consensus from the group of us on the best way we think we should go forward and some some of the sources for tonight's presentation um, the maps and the data that I'm about to show you are from our downtown Reading parking study which was updated in 2018 prepared by consultants Nelson and Nygaard the anecdotal information is largely from stakeholder feedback that we've received as well as conversations that we've had with the police department. And then our philosophy and the opportunities that we see are based on industry practice and also recommendations from the Nelson Nygaard study in 2018. So, the system and challenges. Parking is a system, challenges are systemic. I have a series of maps that I'm gonna show you that will kind of elucidate and I think best illustrate the, the system and the challenges. Um, Starting with this simple figure ground map, the parking in downtown is shown in black and then everything else kind of recedes to gray. Um, we have a total of 3,400 spaces downtown, including private, public, permit, and these spaces. Of the 3,400 spaces, 1,600 are private, and the 1,600 private spaces are broken into seven categories. Um, so while the private, um, parking that we have is an important part of our downtown parking system. It's not the focus of tonight's presentation. The focus of tonight's presentation is really on the spaces that we control. So the public spaces, the permanent spaces, and the spaces that we lease. Um, and so we have 1,300 public spaces, which you see on the map. The important parts of the map, I should have said this earlier, are the things I've highlighted in red. Those are, and I've kind of made everything recede a little bit to the background because I want you to focus on the things I've pulled out, and, but we can dig further into the data at some future point if, you, if you'd like to. Um, so the public spaces, we have 1,300. There are 15 different ways of regulating them, and they're broken down into eight different user types. Wow. Now layer onto that, we also manage 500 permit spaces, and we have eight ways of regulating these permit spaces, three different permit types, and then we also have lease spaces on top of that. So that brings us to our downtown parking system. Um, the downtown can be described as, you know, gen in general terms, 50 acres, 25 city blocks, about a half mile end to end, 
all told less than 0.1 square miles. And within that area, we have two dozen different ways of regulating parking. So let's pause for a minute and think about what the user experience of this is. Um, I have to pause. <laughs> I hear about it every day. Right, that's, a, that's exactly right. Um, so do we know. Yeah, I know. And so do we in all of our public meetings. Um, <laughs> so what I did here is I broke down on the left-hand column um, some of the facets of our current parking system, and then on the right-hand column, what the user experience perception um, of that regulation is. So, um, and I'll just go through this quickly. We can dig into it more deeply, you know, in a future conversation um, or later during Q&A. So the first one is the spaces are categories, categorized or regulated by user type or permit type. So, you know, an individual specific user may drive downtown and you know at that time there might not be a space that's available to them based on the user type or permit type that they are. Um, so that the perception there would be there's not enough parking. Mm -hmm. We have we issue more permits than we have spaces allocated to them. So there we hear frustration that you can have a permit but that doesn't guarantee the space. Um, we um, issue the employee permits to recurring businesses and early birds typically, um, which, you know, we don't really have enough permits for the amount of businesses that we have downtown and the amount of employee, employees that we have. And so new businesses who are come, you know, late to the party feel excluded from the system. And then we have a number of different time limitations and restrictions downtown, and so that leads to, you know, the visitor or resident or employee um, feels like they need to leave the downtown or move their car every two to four hours or some kind of thing like that. Um, and then just in general, as I mentioned, we have a multitude of regulations, some of which are very specific. So that's confusing and frustrating for the user, um, and it's hard to adhere to and hard to enforce. So, and then enforcement I- Enforcement seems to be working very well from what we, what the feedback I get, so. Well, we have a number of people here who probably speak more eloquently about that than I can. Um, so just to take a little bit of a detour and talk about some of the things that we've done, because we have we hear about parking challenges all the time, and we, we do try to implement changes when we can. Um, so just this past year, I believe the police department capped the number of permits they were issuing per business to 10. Um, whether that number is right or wrong is something that we would want to look into further. Um, we added a couple 30-minute spaces to Haven Street down in the Lower Haven area. Um, we heard from some businesses down there that they, they wanted some spaces that could be turned over more frequently. We increased the um, time limit in pub the public parking lots from two to four hours. Um, and that reminds me, actually, some of these have red stars next to them, which indicates that it was a recommendation from our 2018 Nelson Nygaard study. So it's not just something that we like dreamed up. It's actually in context of industry practice. It's a recommendation that we, that we had and that we studied and that we thought might be feasible. Um, to implement. And then we've worked really hard to improve parking signage and wayfinding. You probably remember seeing some of the wayfinding signs that we unveiled at various public meetings in the last couple of years. Um, we have a template for shared parking um, where the town is kind of the middleman between private owners of private lots. Um, I don't know that we've actually used it yet, but we have it available if um, we can get there from a management standpoint. We've worked with a variety of consultants. I think maybe you know two to three different consultants on you know, various studies and wayfinding and recommendations um, to help us manage the system better. We've held or attended a number of meetings with businesses, the chamber, and stakeholders, probably a half a dozen, probably more. Um, and then we just um, closed our Reading, Reimagine Reading survey, but we did have over 1,500 responses and we're still working on aggregating the data and we should, some of the questions that we asked will shed some light, further light into this challenge downtown and potential ways we might, things we might look at um, when we're figuring out how to proceed. So, um, tonight the PTTF is here to request no changes for January 1st, but instead, 
to allow the police department to issue a six-month permit. Um, they usually issue annual permits. But the six-month permit will give the group of us additional time to study some of the opportunities I'm going to describe in a minute. Um, and with that timeline, we would return to you in a few months and present some recommendations as a cross-disciplinary team. So in the meantime, um, as we have been having a number of conversations at PTTF about the downtown parking situation, and we've been strategizing about the best way forward, and a number of kind of philosophies and you know overarching strategy for how to handle the situation has bubbled to the surface. Um, so there are a few tenets to this guiding philosophy. Um, there are things that we kind of all agree would be helpful to the system in general and helpful to the users of the system. And the first one is to expand access, and that would be by aligning supply with demand as best we can. Um, and simplifying the system a little bit. The second um, is leveling the permit playing field. Um, and I can go, I'll go into a little bit more about how I see us maybe getting there. Um, and the third would be empowering the user versus penalizing the user. So allowing the user to pay to stay versus ticketing. Um, um, and I did want to emphasize that this is a data-driven process. You know, parking can be really emotional. We see that when we have conversations with people about it, but we're really trying to kind of gather more data, study the data, and find you know a way forward that can take the emotion out of the process. And then you know nothing is final. So if this, if we if we recommend something for implementation and you agree to it and we do it, and it's really not working, it's this is an iterative process. opportunities for consideration. So this is where we would like um, you to allow us time to further study some things. Um, what I did here is I aligned in the left-hand column our philosophy and then in the right-hand column some opportunities and strategies for, you know, um, in line with that philosophy. So for expanding access and aligning supply with demand and simplifying the system, um, I one thing that we would look into is, you know, whether it would make sense to regulate the spaces first by time and then by the user and the permit. Um, and I know this might be, these ideas might be a little hard to grasp without some specific examples, but I would hesitate the, about getting into specifics tonight without us really having some some strong recommendations and some additional data. Um, but anyway. Um, and then another opportunity here would be to reduce the number of regulations that we have or adapt them to the current situation that we're seeing playing out downtown once we get more data. And potentially abolish leasing altogether, which would free up some spaces for more, you know, make them more available to different users at different times. Then with our second tenant, um, leveling the permitting playing field, just increasing the number of permits altogether and expanding locations for employee parking might be something we would want to consider. Um, and then I was also thinking it might, maybe we need to cap the number per business, like lower that number. Right now it's at 10, like maybe lower it at first so everyone can get some and then if there's leftover, businesses can come back and ask for more. There can be, we'd have to work out really the details of how the process would work. Um, and then with regards to empowering versus penalizing, um, adjusting time limits, which I mentioned we already did in some of the lots. And then we have, um, well, in general, our public on-street parking, our public parking is, is pretty underutilized. Our off-street lots um, are much more highly utilized than our on-street parking. And so it, we, it, that data could justify adding payment kiosks to some of those lots. And, and through that, you know, you'd be allowing someone to say, I need to stay here for four hours. I'm going to pay for it rather than park and then feel like they need to move the car or um, get a ticket or, you know, something like that. So that's something we would, we would need to look into. So with these opportunities in mind, um, some of the additional data that I've listed that we would want to gather, um, it falls into kind of four broad categories, allocation versus use. So um, 
how many spaces do we have versus how many spaces are we selling, how many passes are we selling, sorry, um, and how the spaces are actually being used. So some of the, some of the spaces that are different user types or permit types can use, um, actually digging into like who really is using these, like is it a resident, is it an employee, um, just so we kind of understand utilization better. Um, and then some business specific data, so the number of employees they have on their largest shift, the average length of the customer's visits, where employees park if the permit spaces are all taken, so they have a hang tag and they're driving around and the permitting, permit spaces are taken, like where are they parking. Um, and then ways in which we might you know, increase the supply, so where could we expand where we allow employees to park, and then are there any additional opportunities um, are there any opportunities to add spaces to the system? So like literally looking at streets and widths and seeing like, is there a missed opportunity here um, for us to formalize some parking? And regulatory changes. So, you know, looking at what the potential impacts of adapting our regulations might be. Um, and then pricing for and logistics of implementing kiosks. And adjusting hours and time limits in various locations downtown. So with that, I'm ending here on what our request again is to do, which is no changes for January 1st, but allowing the police department to issue a six month permit. And then we will return to you with some ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. And I'm so excited to see that we might be changing our parking regulations, <laughs> as I think most people do. Um, comments from the board, questions? So, uh, I think this looks very reasonable, looks very appropriate, and, and very well presented. On um, the one you're asking, the businesses, I'm wondering if you also want to ask how many full-time employees they have, not just on the largest shift, but in total. I can imagine situations where one person closes and a different person opens, and, and you know, it's one on the shift, but it'd be pretty hard to, to move things. So that would envision movable permits? Hang tags could be Got used it. in that. I mean, I, I would recommend hang tags in that instance, especially if we are only going to have a finite number of permits that we issue um, to businesses. I'd be really curious what the businesses have to say about that because if you have part time employees yeah, yeah. and someone goes home with it by accident. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we'll look into that. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. John? Oh. So, Julie. Mm -hmm. No surprise, You're, you always have a great presentation that's always well constructed, it's always very professional. But let me give you some practical feedback um, to everyone that's in the room here. Um, if you get no change in what we're doing now for nine months, you are going to have businesses that will run to the end of their lease and move. And I'll tell you why. because. The way that we have this thing structured right now, it's like a fire drill down there. Mm -hmm. So for example, behind Atlantic, you have 14 spaces. Those spaces say the following. These are for employees or anybody else. So I buy a permit and I can't find a spot. So then I go to one of the other spots that doesn't say for employees or anybody else and I get a ticket. While seven of those spots have a person there without any tag at all. Now let's think about this from a practical standpoint. To change nothing for the next nine months will lead to, it'll have negative impacts. We cannot continue to be a government that just says, well, we're gonna study it some more. I mean, look, we've got a parking crisis down there. We lost 15 spaces with the EMARC construction. I, this is real. Um, now, I never have a problem parking because I prowl this town all day long. I know exactly when to make an appointment, where. I'll always get a place to park because I know. But, you know, when you're coming to work or you're coming to shop, you know, or you're coming around a real work schedule, that's a very difficult thing. So from a practical standpoint, I understand exactly where you're going and what you need to study. But we got to get moving. I mean, I mean, I today visited three businesses that have been talking to me because they saw it was on the agenda. They asked if I would stop in and speak with the proprietor on Haven Street. I'm 
I'm telling you, they're freaking out. <coughs> They've got employees who are ready to just get a different job. So, uh, John, I mean, I, I agree with you on the urgency in the sense that I've spoken to some of the businesses as well, um, and parking is amongst their biggest complaint. Um, that said, you know, what we're looking at here and what Julia's put together is a massive overhaul of our parking. I got it. Enforcement, permitting, um, and labor. Like that. I so, yeah, I get it. You know, and as we approach winter, that's also going to impact how this study is conducted. So as we look to do something of this magnitude, while I sympathize for everyone, um, including myself when I can't find parking right in front of where I want to park, um, I would want this to be done thoroughly um, and with an adequate amount of time for the staff to do it well and come forward with their best recommendations. I would suggest, as far as the planning department is concerned and public safety, this is a number one issue. Mm -hmm that this is an issue that should jump to the front of the line. Understand something else. We wouldn't have a program in place for nine months, okay? Now, nine months from now, you're gonna be about six months away from 100 more employees working downtown. I mean, mm -hmm. we did this 40-hour thing. I mean, you know, earlier I, you know, I, I asked all of you to let this thing germinate, and it, and it is, you know, we're, you're going to have a major restaurant that is probably going to have 30 to 40 employees. Um, the amount of commercial space that you're adding, let alone the space that's going to fill that's empty right now, um, I, I just would say I, I hear exactly what you want to do. I know it has to be thoroughly done. I think we got to not be the government. Let's get on it. I mean, let's get going. Um, I think we need to make some, for example, you have 14 spaces. So, John, I, I, let me finish, please. Well, there are other people who would like to. And that's well. fine. Let me finish my thought, and I'll be quiet. You have 14 spaces behind the Atlantic, or the. It's not the Atlantic anymore. <laughs> the sign says, for employees or anybody else. Uh, let me suggest a sign of goodwill along the way. Would make that employee parking, and if you don't have a tag, you get a ticket because the employees are getting tickets. Um, and that's a problem. And you know, you mentioned people think they have to move in four hours. They do. They have to move out of town because we have parking enforcement that says, if you can be parked you know, on the street for four hours and then you can move into the lot and you're gonna get a ticket in the fifth hour because you are in the zone, okay? That. We got We have to send a sign of good faith with small fixes along the way. That's what I would say. Vanessa. Thank you, John. Um, let's give Bob a chance to respond. One uh, forty R was passed by town meeting. We got together and discussed a lot of the consequences. Yes, that we, we have. Did. I will say that the development probably happened faster than any of us imagined in many places. But nonetheless, you know, we did do a lot of discussion and planning um, as we peeled back parking more and more. We had the exact same impression you do right now at first. And then we realized we have to rip the bandage off. This is what we've done for the last 25 years in this town. It does not work. So whether there's a little tweak that might improve things, we couldn't agree on it. We, we use all those different kinds of permits and all those different kinds yeah. of signs. We said the only way to fix this, to really fix it, is to wipe that map clean and start all over. What would we do if we didn't have any rules and regulations? where would we start? So I, I totally hear what you're saying, and we couldn't accomplish that as a group. We couldn't agree on how will this happen, because the situation you're mentioning, there are the same kind of store owners nearby that have the opposite view. They don't care about employee parking. They want customers to park there. So there's always a balance of this version for this business, but that version for that business, because we've heard, we've heard it all. And that's really why we decided there was no short-term fix that's going to make a significant impact that everyone is going to live with, because they're not. Thank this you, Bob. This is a big problem. Andy? A um, couple questions, Julie. First of all, great, great, uh, very professional presentation um, and easy to follow. <clears throat> is it still the case that during peak hours, 
we only have 50% uh, occupancy of our parking spaces, roughly. So that came out of the 2018 Nelson Nygaard study, and they looked at all the public spaces collectively, um, yeah. and then they also looked at on street versus off street. So mm -hmm. if you take the, you know, if you take them all, it's a, it's less than 50% utilization. But if you look at off street, it's it's much higher than right. on street. Yeah. So so um, I I agree with John on on this one. Although I would say that we need to act like uh, like a government should, and and do do something. I don't think we can just keep the same setup, the way the way it is for another nine nine months. And and I I understand that that's um, a huge challenge for um, the planning department. It's not but, a question of a challenge. Just yeah. to be clear, there's a lots of constituents here. They I know. I, uh, yeah. Let me let me let me finish. I. So I think if we have under 50% utilization, um, and and businesses come have said to me, have come up to me, employees have come up to me, and said, you know, I'm getting ticketed right and left. There's not enough parking spaces available. Um, can't we designate? We have enough parking spaces, evidently. So can't we just designate more of them? for business owners, um, employees, so that their employees have a place to spark. It's, it park. It seems that, that we have the capacity. So, you know, as John suggested, make, make some of the parking lots, those parking lots behind uh, the former Atlantic, um, you know, uh, employee parking only. So um, before, thank yeah. you, Andy. Um, before you answer that question, um, do we have Ann and Mark? Do you have any comments to add? Well, one, and just following the point, number one, um, when do the leases expire? So, in other words, what we wouldn't want to do is get into a situation where, you know, suddenly we renew them and then we say we're going to take them back, and then we're like, oh, geez, we have another year we have to wait now. So we probably ought to look at that pretty quickly. Well, it's calendar year. Yeah. So it ends December 31. I think that's part of why the six month thing is. Okay. And Mark, most people, we're already starting to get inquiries. And most people start coming in around December to get them. Yep. Um, so part of it is we're also on a time crunch of, I, John, trust me, I, I get everything everybody's saying, both sides. Yes, we want to be thorough, but the same token, we're on a time crunch to make changes now could be, I don't know how it is, can we even implement the changes in time? That's what we're kind of, yep. um, what can be changed, that's what we're kind of, there's a lot of it. We, we're going strictly, we're just the enforcement part. We, we enforce what's in the traffic rules and regulations. So it's, so we're enforcing what's in there. And um, so some changes would have to change in the traffic rules and regulations. Got it. But right now the permits are coming in. What we said, we've limited it to 10 people because we had businesses coming in when there wasn't a ton of businesses in downtown and basically they were getting whatever they wanted for spots. Now we've been, and 10 is just an arbitrary number we came up with until we can figure out what people need. Yes. So yep. people are coming in, like what do you mean you're already out? That's what we're trying yep. to. And as the businesses increase, it's only going to get worse. Got it. Thanks. And, and the second question, um, if we were suddenly pushed and we had to figure out how to come up with 20 new employee parking spots, I'm going to call them off-site, is that a challenge we could address? I think so. Yes, and they think won't so. be used. That's the problem. Well, but that answers a question very quickly. So if it really is, is horrific, employees can't find anything, they're driving around, if they knew there was a place that they could go, an overflow lot, if they get utilized, then, then we have some answers. And if they don't, I understand you're gonna to wanna to be closer, but if you do a spin and it's not there, you gotta decide what to do. You could go to a guaranteed spot. Oh. Not a guaranteed spot, but a yeah, likely I spot. I understand <laughs> for the big picture, and yes, we do have enough parking, but there are businesses we visited who specifically have said, those are the three spaces I want, I don't want anything else. And then there's other businesses right next door that say those three shot three spots should be for my customers. Right, and I'm not suggesting upsetting where things are until the study is done. What I'm trying to figure out is, is there a place that could become the overflow lot? So literally, no one can can do. It's not a lot necessarily, but a location. Overflow now, but it's mostly for construction vehicles because there's so much going on downtown. But there are some like by the train depot. Uh, like near the right A, the old right A drive-through. Um, that's MBTA lot, but they're probably not watching. 
So we sort of encourage people to use that all the time. But now it's full of contractors. Jane? Yeah, I'd just like to uh, suggest Bob's point about the MBTA. Um, I've spent a lot of time um, going in and talking to people at the T about a couple of areas that here in Reading could be an opportunity for expanding parking downtown. We started several years ago with the Vine Street lot, and we were successful in um, getting a license agreement for a dollar to use those 43 spaces that the T has on Vine Street. And at that time, we contemplated um, allowing employee parking in those 43 spaces. And as we started talking to businesses, they said, oh, who would park there? So we said, all right, well then, I guess it makes sense to have it be parking for the train. Mm -hmm. And that's what those spaces became. Um, for a fact, the businesses that we spoke to said there would be no way any of our employees would park on Vine Street and work in the downtown. Um, another business I talked to recently said, um, you know, I have a fitness business and no one can find any place to park. And I said, well, there's, uh, I don't know, 30 or so spaces down by McDonald's that are um, sort of a, a no man's land of MBTA parking that the T doesn't even think they own, which they do. Um, I said, those are completely unregulated. And uh, I said, it's a fitness center. <laughs> I would think you would park there and walk to the fitness center. And the person said, I don't know if that's gonna work out either. So there are options, and so much of parking is perception. So yeah. much of it is what you're willing to agree to go along with. I understand completely in terms of long term, it has to be completely assessed. I think what we're trying to do is build in some time as you've requested for long term, but see if there's something we could do in the short term. And it may be inconvenient, and they may not get used, but it's an option. And we can see if it gets used or not. But if the, the demand is so problematic that people are getting ready to move out of town, I would imagine they'd, they'd be willing to walk three blocks first. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump in here. Vanessa, could I, I ask to have my question answered first? What was your question? My question was, um, can we, if we have an excess of parking spaces, can we assign some, can we assign some of those as employee only parking? To take off the pressure. Mm -hmm. We can we can try to look into that to release the pressure. Um, I mean, it's something that we've talked about already. We have some ideas in mind already, but you know, I mean, the my impression of what was going to happen tonight was not necessarily that we were going to hone in on any specific thing to try to solve. Um, but like, we can put some things higher on the list. I so respect like, the process. The nine month or, you know, I'm thinking six because I'm thinking we can come back to you yeah. in three, try to work something out for July. So, but but I do understand everything. It won't be a change so till July. It could be longer, right? Yeah. And, I, and it is only October, it's still technically right now. So, so I see what you're saying. But mm -hmm. I think we can can put some of your ideas, you know, higher on the priority list and try to look for some interim solutions. Okay. I just don't know how that would play out in reality and how that would work for the police department. So yeah, all I'm asking for is extra spaces. That's all. So I respect the process that you're going through. It's complicated. You can't just change it overnight. Um, I and I, I like a thoughtful process going through all of, and taking in all these factors into account. Um, but it's, it, we have excess spaces. Can we assign some to? Uh, employee only. Right. So the board is, is sort of in an interesting position, right? So we have heard from staff that they have a short-term and long-term plan to deal with parking. The short-term is to keep the system consistent for six months, which will allow the staff and the board to consider an overhaul of the entire parking structure. Um, what has then been discussed is various individual concerns based off of anecdotal evidence from businesses. My concern here is that we are asking the staff to do double duty. We're asking them to do a short-term solution that has no data behind it other than anecdotal stories um, that may or may not solve the problem in the next six to nine months. So 
by introducing these changes now without any research in a very short amount of time, we may be inadvertently creating other problems or consequences because the staff is essentially trying to prioritize things that we've chosen at random. So my inclination would be to allow the staff the six month request, which is what they're asking for, or give them the time to do their job with the understanding that yes, it means that we are going to be continuing the inconvenience of the parking for residents and for staff, but with the long-term goal of having it be a better solution. That's my two cents. Maybe one of the things we could do in that scenario is ask you folks to come back to us a bit more regularly as opposed to at the end of the process. So we kind of understand what's happening, what's under consideration, you're going to be soliciting opinions not just from businesses, obviously, but from residents as well, people that are parking downtown customers. Maybe we'll have to get that people. Pass. They, they come before we, us quarterly. We anticipated coming back in February. We could come back in January. We can't come back in December. You're welcome. Right. We could come back in January if that's really helpful. Because you know, whatever is being decided has to be, obviously, a full discussion. We're not, we didn't imagine coming in and saying, here's the answer. Here's the things we've learned. Here's the process mm -hmm. we're going through. So, Mark, I think you don't want a I think that's fine. Is the staff comfortable coming back to us in January and giving us an update, with the understanding that it is an update and we will not be yeah. voting on Deciding. anything specifically, <laughs> nor providing opinion on what should or shouldn't be done at that point? Because the data but they have to have they have to have a, a time certain to issue permits, and they need to be able to do that in the next 30 days. Which is why they had made the request for the six month permit. So, so to keep it as is, which is their request. That's why I asked, could they be issued quarterly instead of semi annually? What that would do is it would put the pressure on you to get it done sooner. I don't think it would put the pressure on us, John. We're going to do the right thing. And it's going to take as much time as it takes. Okay, that's why I'm saying if you renew these things quarterly. Yeah. I mean, you you know, you try to get it done in the first quarter of the year, if you can't, because of all the reasons you say, Bob. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I really don't want to do it wrong, no, I, but I, I do want to send a message that says maybe there's little things, and we will go as quickly as we can, as long as we're complete. Yeah, and I think um, the motions that are in your packet that are uh, imagined don't really address any of the short-term solutions that might be later added on to a different motion. Um, if, if you don't do anything tonight, then the police department is going to issue 12-month licenses. Right. 12-month leases, 12-month permits. You've got to do something. So you've got to do something yeah. tonight. I, I mean, I, I'd be inclined to stay with the six months. It's what they've asked for. It allows the staff the amount of time that they need to do the study properly. Um, it doesn't create, you know, a, a rush at the police station from an administrative perspective and the cost associated with it to have to review, or, um, renew all of these permits every three months. Um, if they finish it up sooner, great. We know that they'll have that process implemented for July 1. But if they finish it up sooner, there's no there's opportunity no as of like April 1st for there to be a new system. Because the the permits are put through. Correct. Is well, there is there any? You, you can imagine that no matter when we all agree that we've got the solution, it's going to take a lot of time to communicate this to the town. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, feasibility of this being of, of a new system being proposed by March thirtieth or? I mean, I think we have a lot of ideas mm -hmm. and we have a lot of studies and we, you know. We've been, we talk about this all the time. So you know, I don't want to commit to this group to something we haven't talked about. Sorry. But I do think we could come back in a couple of months with some more concrete ideas. The, the challenge will be some of the data that we need to gather. We won't have that much time to do that. Um, so you wouldn't be able to come back in that amount of time with a proposal to overhaul them. There might be some things that we feel co more yeah. confident about than others. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. so um, in that sense, a, an, an update would mm -hmm. make sense. but. But you wouldn't be coming before us with a full proposal. You, you, you don't answer. I, I know I can't. Yeah, it might be unlikely. But I also do think that, you know, 
irrespective of the six month permit, there might be some things we could implement yeah. in the meantime. Like we could expand where employees can park, and that won't necessarily impact the employee permit. Like they'll just have more places to park. So there are things that maybe could be implemented within that time frame. Um, you know. So I mean, again, essentially, before the board has to determine whether we are going to. Um, authorize the town to sell six-month permits, do nothing, and allow them to do 12-month permits, which I think we can all agree is not the direction we want to go. Um, there has been the proposal for three-month permits, but it doesn't seem to me like we'll be ready to act at three months, in which case we're creating more work for everyone without a plan in place at the three-month mark. So, um, I'd like to throw something out. And sort of on the fly here, so. Um, you want to give us my, more options? If my colleagues, um, I just quickly talked to a few, and people think it's not a bad idea. Here's one idea that might um, get us closer, but more quickly. If the board would consider eliminating the leases, or well, we would just have one system, one hang tag, and that would be what you would buy for your permit. You wouldn't have a reserve space. Um, um, I, I can't speak for the rest of the board. What's the difference? Mm. A lease spot. <laughs> Sorry, come speak. Christine's my expert, so I'll be both of I know I have good talent. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, and I know you will. Um, a lease spot guarantees you a specific spot at a specific location. Mm -hmm. All guaranteed, all the time. No one else can use it. No one else can use it. You might not use it, but no one else can use it. You okay. want Employee parking is employee parking for everybody. So it's kind of whatever, if it happens to be open that day or it could be the next spot next over or just down the street. But a lease fate guarantees you that one spot, that exact number spot, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So you want it. And so those spots, they're open. There are 58 so, of them, I see. 60, 67. Yeah, they're $60 a year. And then you get it from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Okay. And then the employee pass is twenty dollars a month, so two four, they pay two forty a year up front, and it's different zones, and it's not guaranteed. Um, so. Wasn't easy. Yeah, yeah. It's, so it's, I, I think your mistake was giving us another option. All right. So, so these spaces keep going to the same five businesses too every year, so it's not we have, and that's just the past practice of the police department it hasn't changed with all the new businesses here. Um, and that's probably the issue that that's what we're running into is. We have the rules haven't adapted to the downtown. Right. So the tr the way we've been doing things for years that's worked isn't working now, and it's definitely not going to work right. in the future. And that's so, to... will this removal of the leasing option cause other potentially unintended consequences? Because that that's I guarantee it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's also not actually on our agenda tonight. That concept. So I don't feel like. We could vote on that tonight. Um, let's table that noted. Bob? <laughs> uh, I think under the agenda item, pretty much do anything that's related. Now, I feel like, we, but I feel like it's as not. As a moral obligation. Yeah, we haven't really, there, so, it's, yeah. it's not it's out there. It would okay. be without having the opportunity for public input. I feel like, personally, I wouldn't feel comfortable voting Fair. on that tonight. All right. So, Vanessa, back to even if the board agrees on March 31st what to do, I really think communication to the whole town is very important. Mm -hmm. it's going okay. to take some time. Andy? I, 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 I get the impression that, that um, what I've asked is, is a burden to the staff and asking them to do double duty. And I want to make clear that's not the case. I'm not asking anyone to do double duty here. And I, I, as I said, I'll say it again, I think going through the process needs to be done. I don't want to see quick changes to the traffic regulations made. It was this, my simple question is, how much of an effort does it take to add a parking space or make a parking space employee only? Andy, it depends, honestly, some of it might be easy, some of it might not. If that, if the traffic rules and regulation has it designated as a certain thing, correct me if I'm wrong, you would, you would have to um, vote on it to yeah. change it, and so we could change the signage, we could then enforce it. So it's not that easy. No, no, it has to go through a public hearing process. Yeah. It's not right. that complicated, but this is yeah. just that. 
right, thank so, you. So again, the board before it has to make a decision. Are we voting to approve the six month permits or not? If you ask one more question, Mark, I, <laughs> I was going to support you, but now I'm not sure. <laughs> Jeez. I think that um, we should support this six month. Let's see where we are in January. Perhaps there are some things that are doable at that point, perhaps not, but let's get a report in January okay. to talk about. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Um, I almost lost it. Is, uh, <laughs> Can I get a feel of the board? Are we comfortable moving forward with the six month? Sam? Yes. John? We can't leave it at a year for sure. Oh, I, I, you know, I honestly think mm -hmm. we should be more aggressive, but. Okay. Andy? I'm okay, and, and I'm glad they're coming back in January. We get to see you again. Okay. Um, so as I look at this motion, it appear it's the bottom one, correct? That's the bottom yes. one. That's the, the employee's. Let me ask you a question before the <coughs> um, And this is a delicate question. Do you want us to enforce between now and our next meeting? What define enforce? Should we give, be giving out tickets that we don't rip up? Um, can you explain a little bit more? <laughs> I don't know if I can be any more simple without being in jail. <laughs> the police department has gone to an issuing tickets after putting all kinds of warnings and notes on the cars and being ignored. They've given out tickets. That has brought the person into the police station, at which point they say, okay, now you understand the rules. If we see you again, it's going to be a fine, but we'll take care of this one. How do you want the police to enforce the current traffic regulations? We understand it's a mess, so we're a little reluctant to enforce a set of messy rules. Now having this discussion in public, I know can create even more of a mess, but I think it's important to give them guidance and meet guidance. What's your expectations? Do you want to have people continue to complain about parking tickets, or do you want it to be the wild west? And we're good either way. It'll work itself out. Okay, yeah, we're not talking, to be clear, we're not talking fire lane and handicap. No, 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 we're, no, talking, no. we're talking more of the parking. employee versus non-employee, yes. four hours, that it, it's... Uh, um. Uh, that was not a topic I was prepared to discuss, but okay. I, I, I kid him. I have some, I have some, yeah, working um, as someone who enforces regulations um, himself, um, there's such a concept as enforcement discretion. Discretion is the key word, yes, there is. Yes, so, so I wouldn't, given the state of things now, um, I, I would encourage the, um, police to use their enforcement discretion on, on these things. Very diplomatically stated. Yeah. I agree yeah. with you. I, I think the Wild Wild West is a really bad idea. Yeah, I'd, well, and I'd, I'd rather remain consistent, considering we know that there's going to be changes on the horizon. Well, what's the Wild Wild West part? Anybody can park anywhere, anytime, no, no enforcement. Tickets. Accepted fire lanes and handicaps. Do you, know, you know, enforcement discretion, do you know what that does to the police officer in the street? Yeah. It puts them in a very difficult position, and I don't like it. It can. It's like, okay, I'm going to be nice to this guy, but I'm not going to be nice to that one. No, nope, that's not what it means. Well, so how do you define discretion then? All right, so, okay, hold on. Let's bring it back to what we have to talk about. We have to vote on the six-month permit. There is a cost currently associated with them. 20 per month. Uh, it looks like 20 per month, 30 and 25 on the back page. Uh, are these the recommended fees, Bob? Those are the current fees, so I don't have any suggestion to changing the current fees. Okay. Um, so is the board comfortable with keeping those fees as is, especially yes. given the short-term nature of it? Yes. Great. And all we're talking about are the parking places, not the stickers, correct? This is different from, yes, the, the, okay. these are parked on the different for the depot sticker, the combo sticker. Yeah, that's, 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 that's next. I know. <laughs> Uh, All right. there's, there's two motions specifically. One is to sell employee parking stickers as they've described for 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. And the other on the back page is to continue to sell the leased spaces, the guaranteed spaces, for $30 a month for six months each. All right. Um, Gene, I appreciate your creative effort to come up with a solution. I think um, for the sake of everyone's sanity, let's keep it the same. Great. All right, Mark, could I have you read the first motion, please? Yes. 
move that the select board authorize the town manager or designee to sell employee parking stickers hyphen downtown business district as described in section 5.2.1 of the traffic rules and regulations but that the term be for six months effective 1 1 2020 with a cost of twenty dollars per month paid up front is there a second second oh. all those in favor opposed okay motion carries Move that the select board authorize the town manager or designate to sell leased parking program for merchants and employees permits as described in section 5.14 of the traffic rules and regulations, but that the term be for six months, effective 1 1 2020, with a cost of $30 per space per month paid up front, or $25 per tandem space per month paid up front. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Julie, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. See you in January. Uh, nice. <laughs> Hopefully sooner. Hopefully sooner. Yes. Bob, oh, yeah. <laughs> Bob, for future agendas, can we just make sure that she's included for January? Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. All right, next up we'll be hearing of an update regarding the Main Street Road Diet Trial. So Bob, is this you or? Yeah, I'll, I'll do it, but anyone, including board members, can uh, chime in. I know some of you attended the meetings. Um, MassDOT has met with staff and some members of the public, including members in the room, uh, a couple of times. <coughs> They've expressed an openness to studying the road diet concept on the southern section, which was not originally uh, described by them and offered as, as an alternative. Um, so there's no problem with sort of opening that door. But I will say my observation is from the fellow in the room that actually had to do the logistics and do the work, his head was spinning. Um, he's got a road diet on the northern section. He's got a contract that expires with the contractor next winter. And he doesn't know logistically how he's going to do all this. So I just caution you that we still don't know from the state that this is a go. We just said, thank you very much, we'll take it under consideration. And I believe they genuinely are trying to figure out a way to do it. But some of the things they're going to have to struggle with is if you have two sections of town that each want to have a road diet trial of some sort, and you want to have it studied when school is in session, and you don't know what the weather might be. Uh, they openly said they didn't know if they could complete either of those in the spring. And would we want to continue the road diet as a trial during the summer when they could continue to collect data, but it wouldn't be as legitimate as when school's in session, and then they would continue into the fall. Now, let's just pretend that's what they have to do for both sections, and they do them at the same time, which we don't know is possible. Um, that means the construction season is put off until the following spring, which is not what their current contract says. So they'll have to work on the financial aspect of what it would cost to extend that contract. So again, you know, the spirit is willing here. We just don't know what their realistic options are that they can offer to the town as a practical matter. Um, they, they listened very well. Um, you know, they took our advice and our request pretty well. Um, but I, I just, and I'm, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just being realistic. I don't know what they can deliver because they don't know what they can deliver as of the last meeting we had. Um, we still think it's correct to divide the projects into two parts, the northern section and the southern section. As far as I know, the northern section is going to continue no matter what happens in the south as a road diet tried. The only thing that's now called into question is when. When does that happen? It, it could happen in the spring. They were saying, I think, the end of May, but about the earliest they could really get out there because they have to set it up in April depending on the weather and that they wouldn't have enough time while school is in session to finish gathering the data. So would the town prefer that they not start till September? And I said, well, I can't answer that question. I don't really know. Um, and then on the southern section, a similar set of uh, questions and answers, but that road has already got its first coat down. Um, so they're prepared in the spring to finish that section of the road if nothing else happened. They have work to do on the curbs, work to do on the sidewalks, um, some of the entrance ways, but the road itself is further along in a construction sense. So this request is turning that on its head in a way, um, and asking, you know, asking them to cancel the project you thought you had and change it, which 
again, they wouldn't to speak. So some requests came in, Pearl Street and others, about can you please take this action on my street for safety reasons, which we totally understand. Just about every request that came in is going to be impacted by the road diet, especially on the northern section of town. We know what the current traffic is like. We know that it's going to change with the road diet, but we have no idea how. We, we have guesses, and they had guesses. They said it'll just mean people wait twice as long. No one's going to change their route, and we don't think that's really going to happen. So for instance, um, you know, the cut through will probably increase, I'm guessing, uh, over Haverhill to uh, over Franklin down to Haverhill at the light. Which is, I'll skip all that road diet stuff near you know, the southern section of Main Street, and I'll go here. Uh, the point is, we can all speculate and guess, but again, we don't have good data. We don't know. Uh, MassDOT is very willing to gather data in both these sections, but again, not every single side street, just samples as determined really by the staff they left here. Um, so, so that's an update. That's why you didn't have any specific actions and hearings tonight. You know, we could have brought forth requests. We have no idea what the traffic's going to change into, and again, the theory is the reason for some of the requests are increased traffic. What's going to happen with this whole new concept of a road? Is it going to increase more, or is it going to decrease? We don't know. Um, we, we truly don't know. We can take some guesses, but even among the staff here, they sometimes guess in opposite directions. So I, again, it's kind of a data gathering exercise. Try to get to you know, as many facts as you can. Um, and has anyone heard from the state since our last meeting? I have not. Okay. I'm still working this out of the Yeah, okay. They did take me up on my offer today in an email okay. to go for a ride. So I can find out some areas of concern. Okay, excellent. Yeah, That's but good. I just got that email before Park this afternoon. Bob. I bet they didn't okay. give you a date though, did they? <laughs> so it is going a little slow, but again, they're, they're being a receptive audience. So, Bob, you just detailed that this diet could be two years out. Uh, let me think about that. Uh, it should be finished by then, but yes, it could go okay. past one and year. And in, sure. in the interim period, you're suggesting, or the committee is suggesting, that imminent safety issues are to be ignored for two years there. while we wait and see what happens. No, that's that's not what we believe there's any imminent safety issues. Well, I, I, would, I would invite you to go down Pearl Street because the cut through that's coming down Franklin is backing up on Pearl, and that's the way that they're taken off, and they come down Pearl Street to that little funny street that has room for one car, yeah. and they stack up on both sides, and they're trying to make left turns. I know that many neighbors have requested that we look at what makes perfect sense, diet or no diet, to make a right turn only um, at that particular little cutout on Pearl, right at the end of Lucy. Pearl and uh, Maine? Pearl and Maine. Okay. You're talking about, you're talking about the Stella Hill Hill portion, John, you're talking down towards Rocky Road? You know, I'm talking about if you, you know, Fair show. Where, we're, where we are talking about is Lucy comes on to Pearl mm -hmm. and Main, you can see Main Street and there's, you can turn in, turn out, come down there in the morning. Well, no, it is the so, I mean, but John, we're, we're, we have just heard from the town manager that there, while there are concerns that merit investigation, there are not eminent well, dangers. Okay, so you can you can listen to that, or you can go there every morning like I do and watch it. And what we're seeing, and you have neighbors that are writing you over and over again about this particular thing that I'm talking about and it's going ignored, and it, I'm shocked by it. Well, to be honest with you, John, traffic is changing so fast in this town. I sent the deputy an email this morning about something that's been happening for 10 days. When the apps decide to change and they send you on a different route, all the pa traffic patterns change. So it's a difficult moving target. People are always gonna look for the line of re least resistance. We know that. So Bob, as a point of clarification, um, this is a helpful update, so thank you. Um, what is, are you looking for guidance or anything from us as a board at this point? Uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, one or, or more of you uh, has been attending and may still attend whatever the next meeting is, which we don't know yet. Uh, they haven't really asked.
asked us any questions that I think would require any of your decisions. The only conceptual thing is, do we want to have a trial road diet set up during the summer if work is not completed in the spring? And they made it sound like work almost for sure is not going to be completed in the spring in either section. So in either would, section. Would you have any value or should you just wait till September? Well, there's no, it wouldn't result in a legitimate. They said they'd gather extra data, but it wouldn't have as much meaning as when school is in session, so. But I mean, what's the alternative, right? If they, oh, okay, yes, pull up. Uh, just point of clarification, I don't really think that's our decision. I think what will end up happening, I think uh, as far as construction is concerned, if they get that first coat down, they have to strike it. Yeah. So if they're ready to strike, they're gonna strike it, and they're just gonna say, do you want to extend into the fall period and collect more uh, school data, or you have to cut it short? But otherwise, I think they're going to strike it as soon as they get that intermediate course down, because they have to. They can't leave it on strike. Right. Um, and that, that, is that what we? That's correct. Yeah. That was my understanding. But that would presume they start work on the northern section. So again, in late it's, spring, it's, which I thought was still an unanswered question. And it, it still is. I mean, it's always an unanswered question when winter's going to break, when everyone's going to be able to So if they don't start in May, they might start in August, in which case, I guess, so maybe at the point is they decide based on the weather and other factors, not so much our choice. So we can, when um, do you think we can anticipate an, another update on this, even if it's not from the full PT, TTF, when, but uh, just a update as, as you know them. I, I'm not sure when the next time frame is going to be. I think it's November, but no one really pinned down a date. We were looking at the third week of November, but I haven't okay. gotten back to you. Yeah. Um, so, so it might end up being December. Okay. So what? Not your next meeting, possibly. But meeting. sometime in December. All right, so why don't we just December. look for that update, and at this point we'll remain silent on it until we know more. Is the board comfortable with that? Yeah. Thank you all very much for the update. Thank you. All right. Um, now you still have uh, parking stickers and at the depot and the compost center. Yep. So next up, we will be voting on the train depot parking stickers and, and the corresponding compost stickers. Bob, will you be presenting that? Um, sure. Um, currently, the board has a 12 month $150 combination pass on the train, on the train depot and compost center. No other discounts, no other exceptions like per car. Okay. Uh, you also have a 12 month um, uh, depot sticker only, and there's two options there. Uh, seniors get a discount, they pay $15, and the rest of uh, the folks pay $25, and then they have no privileges at the train station. So again, the first sticker takes care of both. The second one only does the uh, compost center. Um, John has discussed uh, at least that there be an option, which I've tried to put in in a motion. I'm not sure how you want to proceed, but um, the idea of selling a family pass, a single car family pass, so you could only use it one at a time, but it doesn't have to be associated with a specific license plate in a specific vehicle. Now, the only way we can think of accomplishing that is instead of a sticker on the car, obviously it's a hat. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's a Only the that or a second one, but I do see, and yeah. we heard it from it again today. The, yeah. the person sent us an email again today. It's not unreasonable yeah. that if, you're, if your cars are lined up in a single driveway, right. and they are, and in some places they're lined up and people are parked on your street and there's nothing you can do about it. And where do you put one car when you got the snowbank and the cars and you try to get the other one out because that's the one with the sticker? I mean, so let's find a way to, you know, accommodate that. You know, is it an extra 15 bucks or is, a, is it an hanging card? I don't yeah. So I, I think, you know, the, the system as it used to be was you could get two stickers. Um, right. For a nominal fee. For a nominal Second fee. Was that, right. And I... I'm in, my opinion is that we should have the not that same system, and the reason is simply from a practical matter. So as a household with two cars, um, where one member is, is leaving at different times or the other, the concern with me from a placard, for the placard is simply practical, which is that one person is going to take off with that placard in the car and yes. the other person's yeah. straight. So, 
now you have to pay $25 for the ticket or you park in another neighborhood um, like mine. So yep. my inclination... In your driveway. <laughs> Yeah. I see them every day. So yeah. um, my inclination would be to offer the dis second pass okay. at a discounted rate and just have it be a sticker. The nice thing there is that hopefully from an administrative perspective, there's not multiple types of stickers now that right. staff have to deal with. It's mm -hmm. a, a joint, a second, and a compost dump. Can I just ask the chief deputy a question? Yes. Um, the old system was by address. Or was it by address and family name? It was um, the phone top edge was a little more stricter. So we were um, yes, we kind of relaxed the relationship. It was the same address, um, and they came in. The rule was it came kind of at the same, same time. Name. Yeah, so it was the same sticker, Vanessa. So it wasn't multiple stickers. We just walked in the system, discount the second sticker or the third sticker. Um, so it didn't change the amount of stickers. And our enforcement was is actually easiest for us. And I agree that actually easier for us than the park would be. Um, yeah. We're fine with whatever. The only thing is, I would just ask for our discretion. It was pretty strict that they had come at the exact same time, which sometimes was, oh, it wasn't feasible. They had the license, the registration. As long as we have the flexibility, have my staff make the determination that this is everything's legit, we can do that in the computer system now and everything. It, uh, for us, it doesn't honestly matter. It doesn't make much of a difference um, how we do it, as long as like that's not much to ask for a big convenience. It's not. No, I no, think. No, no, no. Okay. I mean, that's a big convenience. Yeah. And and affordable yeah Mark? so I think um, structurally I think that makes sense to have back to the, the two sticker structure um, I think the, the bigger issue to some extent is um, now that we understand what the true costs are for the, the two programs um, they, they don't cover their costs they don't come close to covering their costs. Well, you know we knew that I, I think it depends on how so I had asked Bob to circulate the the information on the cost um, and I think it depends on how you break down that cost mm -hmm. because one of the things that's included in this one is the MBTA assessment right, right which, which relates to the train station but it relates to the train station but whether or not we own those parking spaces we still have to pay that assessment so right. in my mind that is not a fee that the commuters should be forced to pay for <coughs> because that assessment affects all Reading residents, not the. I agree with that. I think that, that I, when I looked at that, I thought it was not. I understood why you put yeah. it there, yeah. Yeah. but I could easily yeah. rationalize taking that one out and leaving everything else. No, yeah. and that's why I broke it down. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's good information to have, but I, I agree. I don't think it's appropriate to put that burden on the um, commuters. We they have no. There's a MBTA. Rail line and ready. Right. That that's just the way it is. We don't have control over that, and I don't think it's fair to make uh, a subsection section of the population pay for it. Agree. Mark, are you comfortable with that? Um, not really. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that that's right. I mean, I think that for using that system, the commuters are the ones using it every day. The other town residents use it sometimes. I use it sometimes. I don't buy a sticker anymore. Um, but to kind of zero it is basically saying okay that it's a it's a town cost that's just the way it is well first it, of all, is, it is a town, town cost, cost but it, the value of our understood homes but town exactly. cost meaning the value of your home is a direct correspondent to that being there yeah. and you know and i never take that train but i know the value of my home mm -hmm. is accelerated because we have a train stop there Agreed. you know I, and and this is to my point which is that if we were to sell those parking spaces to Mm. Anyone, the private, private sector, company, the MBTA, yeah. right. that assessment would remain the same and still be divided amongst all of the residents. But you'd have a revenue stream to counteract it by selling all the spaces. Right? So the, the question is how much do you want to offset it? That, that's what we're talking about, right? They're, they're distinct. We're going to pay the fee no matter what. The question is what, how much do we, are, are the, the commuters going to go through? If the commuters today decide to use the MBTA parking lot, and they buy a monthly pass, they pay $5 a day. If they don't buy a, a monthly pass, they pay $6 a day. But they're already paying the cost that we as the town pay to cover that lot, including plowing and staffing and enforcement. And that's where the 150 came from last time. 
So as close as we could make as it. Clo without right. making we it. We knew it was going to be light. Right. Right. right, right. And so that's the notion of $128,000 per year, roughly, in town maintenance costs yeah. yes. that we're trying to And, and that's, that's offset. a little light, but it's stuff you can defend, as opposed to, Jane, send me a whole list. Got it, got it. So if we, in fact, go with the convenience angle of a second sticker again, that, that kind of structure at some, some discount, um, we actually would be probably doing, we get closer to the total cost. In other words, you'll be issuing more stickers at some price, and therefore your total revenue actually goes up and gets closer to the, to the cost of maintenance. If you issue new stickers as opposed to old stickers, just cost less. No, I'm suggesting that if if right now you have people that aren't buying a second sticker because they don't want to pay the full hundred fifty dollars, if there was a lesser charge, some of them will buy stickers. That's absolutely right. Um, and then the flip side is if someone is buying two and they really don't need two all the time, but they decide to do that, we don't have that data. Who knows what's more likely? Right. Yeah. So if they don't use it, we're okay. The Right. If, if we base it off of last year's numbers, the total cost was, of strictly the town expenses, was 128000 right. right. So if we're looking at this, you know, in fiscal year 18, we were at 182, and in so far in 19, which presumably it won't change, we're at 176. So even assuming for some increase in those expenses from the town, because the ones in Bob's memo date from 2017, we're technically overcharging probably by like a dollar. <laughs> but, but hang on one second. So the, the 180 includes compost center. So we should look at compost center costs also. So that turns out to be roughly $80,000 was your estimate. It's like 25 bucks. Mark, right. can I just tell you that when we went from $25 to 150, there was a goal that would cover costs. Right. But honestly, I mean, we went from 25 to 150, yeah. Yeah. which was like, you know, the shock value of that was enormous, mm -hmm. first of all. And we actually, when we discussed that, understood that we weren't really covering costs. And at a certain point, given all kind of all the chaos, I would suggest that, you know, we probably hold the line on where we are. Um, I felt that I've heard from many people, and I know you have all too, that that second sticker at a discounted price is is really a value add. You know, maybe what they when they come in together to sign, they agree that they won't be using two at once. I, you know, I mean, you're not going to be able to enforce that because you guys will go crazy. Okay, and they, they should say that. Can't. But you know, yeah, you, you can't say enforce that, it. You know, you ask people to. You, it's a kind of a respect and honor thing. You know, um, and honestly, I think that if we start trying to split the hairs here, we're going to drive ourselves crazy. And uh, given the recent um, exponential increase in in the fee as well, I don't think we want to pile on and create disincentives for residents to use the commuter rail. There are already so many cars on the road, and um, and the the cost of, of commuting, however you're commuting, are very high. Um, and so I think we don't want to be disincentivizing. Um, I, I don't disagree. Um, if we look at the, the, the cost per day for parking at $150, if you're working 200 days a year, it's less than a dollar a day. It's very cheap. Right. Mm -hmm. It's exceptionally cheap. No doubt. No doubt. So, you know, if, if that moves a little bit, I, I'm not sure that that changes your decision to drive or not. You know, if it, you know, if we suddenly quadruple it, sure it does. It'll go crazy. But changing a little bit, I'm not sure, makes that, that thing change. Um, what I was suggesting is that we, we, now that we know a little bit better about costs, we make sure we cover costs. I understand the issue on now on the state assessment and thinking about it. Um, and it may be that leaving that roughly where it is covers the maintenance costs, especially if we add a second sticker at some reduced cost, because there'll be a little extra revenue that comes in. Um, and then looking at the compost center, it looks like if, breaks even, so it about breaks even. It's probably a little bit under, but not too far off. Yeah. Well, the compost yeah. also brings in profit, correct, with the sale of? No, no. I don't think so. Okay. So I think the only, the only other question that we haven't talked about is whether we would do something for a senior discount for parking at the depot. 
and, and I, I, I have heard the Council on Aging I know has oh. talked about it and is very interested in it. The, the only concern is that if you take, I don't know how you define, how, is, how do we define seniors? Is it 65? Older than I am. Right, so there, there are a number of people <laughs> uh, who are still commuting to Boston, and, and I don't think our intent is, is to, to change their rate. I think our intent is to offer an opportunity for seniors to, to have that parking spot somewhat close to the downtown. So I, I would encourage us to think, is there a way we can figure out how to do that in addition to, so, to this? Thank you. There's a public comment. Hi. If you could just um, stand, say your name and address, please. Gina Durocco, Nolwood Road. And so I am one of the people in the morning in my jammies screaming my car out of the driveway because it's only one car wide. So I appreciate you discounting the second sticker. And I do think there'll be more, a lot more revenue from that because we were one of the families who did not hear. I refused to pay an extra $150 for a second sticker for, not, for nothing because we were paying for the right to use a spot, not a spot for a particular car. But my question really is about the compost center. We've lived here for 20 years and never once used it. Am I paying for the compost center with my um, parking sticker? No. It's a freebie. So it's just it's, a treat? It's just a... Yeah. It's, just it's a buy one, get one. Yeah, it's a throw-in. Yeah. It was a throw-in. When we did it, it was a throw-in to try to soften you know, I get the, that. You know, the, the jump, yeah. you know, and that's... I get that, and that's great for everyone who uses the compost center. Yeah. So you just heard that we're not covering costs as it is. So, so you know... Um, a couple of thoughts to go off of what Ann said. I think, given the previous discussion about um, the amount of traffic that we have in, in Reading, we want to encourage more people to use the commuter rail. Um, and I also think that all the commuters, at least the resident commuters, they're also, they pay property taxes in town. And, and they, they deserve to get something for that. And I think reasonable expectations of parking is, is one of those. So I don't think we need to cover all of our costs, um, but I think a, uh, I, I think we've, we've put it at 150. I would leave it, leave it there, make the second sticker for the same residents a nominal fee, fifteen dollars or something like that. I would not put. I would not say to the people that when they go pick up their sticker, uh, you can only use one of these at once. Um, you know, um, and um, and leave it at that. So, I, you know, essentially before us, we need to decide the cost of the single twelve-month pass. The cost of a second sticker, which we seem to be in agreement on that should be a nominal cost. Um, the cost for the compost only, right? Is that yes? Um, and the cost for a discounted senior pass. So for the compost. For the compost. For the compost only. Excuse me. Um, so with that in mind, feeling of the board as we go down these motions, are we comfortable with keeping it at 150? Yes. 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 Reluctantly. Noted. All right. So we have it at 150. Um, the second motion, is this the, sick, the second pass? Is that what that's well, that, implying? We're going to have to change the wording if you're going to head more towards the second pass, not a single uh, family pass. Okay. Can I suggest I have words for that? Okay. Just kind of read just for a second. Yep. So it would, instead of cross out family single car, instead it would say to sell second passes to residents at the same address purchased at the same time. Is that pretty close to it? That's what you want, right? I think he said not the same time. What I asked I think you is, did you want, because some of the feedback, just to be honest with you, yep. and we're the ones that deal with it is, my wife works different hours than I do. For us to come back, for us to come down here at the same time, because we used to make them produce a license. Right. Yeah, because it does right. the lock, so the rule does say simultaneously. It says the residents have to come in simultaneously. Right. Don't you sell them seven days a week? We do. It's just, I'm just telling you, I'm just 24 sure. hours a day? Well, I'm sharing some of the feedback. <laughs> People come in and say, like, we say, you need to have the other person with you, we need to have their license and registration at the same time. 
that that's going to be the rule, that's fine. I just want to make sure that we have some clarification of how, just, I'm just looking at how you want us to enforce it. That's what is, I'm if, is it possible to, however you log them in the system, if someone says, my spouse came in and they already purchased it for their car, can you easily, Very easily. look it up? Yeah. Yes, in our internal system, absolutely. Okay, yeah. so would that be a reasonable solution for the staff so that people could buy them separately if needed? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, yep. thank you. So we could eliminate uh, so purchase at the same time. Yeah. Yes. We have four drivers in our house. <laughs> Only one goes to the train station. Mm -hmm. Are you going to limit it to two per household? Good question. How many cars? Well, we have four. We okay. I mean, there. personally, I'd be inclined to leave it at two because I feel like after that, you have a lot of adults in a household. Um, it should be fair to. I have a hard time justifying allowing three permits or four permits mm -hmm. for one household. That's a lot of adults. At that point, I feel like it merits its own. It, it, I think we it, do the second one and see how this works. Yeah. yeah. We did the last thing to see how it works, and it didn't work. Yeah. You know, we needed to make an adjustment. You know, we're new at this. <laughs> yeah. So I really, we are. This yeah, is like no, a yeah. So, so, yeah. so we'll max it at, a, at one discounted. Mm -hmm. uh, could, could I, uh, before we finalize that, mm -hmm. um, could I point out that I think that when you have maybe three adults in the same uh, residence uh, needing parking stickers for the train station, um, <clears throat> it's quite possible one or more of those are students going to some university down in, in, in uh, downtown or a community college or something like I, that. I side with John on this one. I mean, there are going to be so many exceptions to Sorry, why so. there are multiple adults living in a home. I, we just can't, I just don't feel like we can go down yeah, this I, rabbit that's hole. that's what I think, too. And I, and I think the, the object is not to get you two, two full-time stickers for the price of one and a buck. Right. The idea is that is to assist the convenience that mm -hmm. um, that this lady has talked about, and, and it's legit. I mean, I you know I get that. Well, that's what I was gonna say. It's not we don't have three commuters. I hear you. No, uh, I I understand. Don't want to see the All right. All right. Um, so are we comfortable with second pass at same address, with a maximum of two per household? Yeah. Two total. Yes. Two total passes, yeah, I'm not good. two Second one's passes. discounted, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Phrase that however you like. All right, just as you said it. All right. Second pass residence, same address, with a max of two per household. Okay. Massive two. Can you read the motion so we can? Move that the, so this is, I'm not making the motion, I'm just reading it, okay? okay? <laughs> two total passes per household, rather than two, two discounted. Why don't we let them read it? Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, the motion would be, move that the select board, authorize the town manager or designee to sell second passes to residents at the same address with a maximum of two per household at one, oh, at one time's gone. Yeah, well, and it has to be- uh -huh. To sell one additional. To one additional mm -hmm. pass at the same address. At yeah. yeah, that's because we don't want to imply that they can't buy another $150. Well, so one additional discounted yes. pass. Uh, bureaucracy. Okay. What's the discounted rate? We have to talk $15. about $15. I'm going to throw it at the random one. 10. It used to be 10. So I'm going to suggest 25. That's actually feels right to me, too. John? I'm going to go with as long as it's deeply discounted from the 150. I mean, you know, we're charging 15 for the second one on a compost. So, you know. I'm fine at 25. Why 25? Just curious. Uh, there is going to be some administration that's going to go on, especially because we're now allowing for the separation. Mm -hmm. So it could be visiting twice to the station to get things done. In fact, we're kind of anticipating that's going to happen. Um, and in fact, we're not quite covering our costs, and I think this will help get there. A, a philosophical difference, but if that's the, the will of the board, I'll, I'll okay. go along with that. So let's go with $25 for the discounted. I, you know, I just, I think we're unnecessarily splitting hairs over, over rounding errors. Yes. Um, so, great. So we're all in agreement. Uh, let's have a motion. <laughs> I think 25 is ridiculous. 
Uh, I kind of, I, I, I kind of agree with John. I mean, what, what in the end, what does it matter, really? Um, we, I agree. We, it we is ten thirty. We, we still have to we, talk about a couple of other things. We raised them. We're arguing over ten dollars. We went from per permit. We went from what fifteen dollars to one hundred fifty dollars. We went from twenty-five. Uh, twenty-five to one hundred fifty. Yeah. That was a huge increase, and last year, one year gone. Yeah. All right. Uh, so here's the thing, and there are there is a majority of the board that is comfortable with twenty-five dollars. While I would love to reach consensus, this seems like an unnecessary discussion. I am going to suggest that we keep it at twenty-five dollars, given the majority board is comfortable with that. And Mark, would you please read the motion? So the two motions. First is move that the select board authorize the town manager or designee to sell resident 12 month effective 1120 combination train depot and compost stickers for $150. Did we already vote on that one? No, no, yeah. no we didn't. All right, we're just going to All right, and now second the second one. So are we doing these separately? Are we doing this? Yeah. Vote? We can do them separately. Okay. All right, so is it Andy's the second? Yeah. All right, all those in favor? Great. All right. Move that the select board authorize the town manager or designee to sell one additional combination train depot and compost sticker to residents at the same address for $25. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right, next up we have the compost only sticker. It is currently at $25 for seniors age 65 or older. It's 25 no. oh, sorry, for six everyone, and then for seniors, it's 15. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so 25 for just the compost and 15 for seniors. Are we comfortable keeping it at those numbers? I am. Yes. Look at that consensus. Is there, are we continuing to sell a second one to the same family for a discount? We haven't been with the, um, the compost only stickers. We've been, um, the compost only, we've kept everybody as the, um, the 25. I just wonder. I mean, I buy two every year. I've yeah. always bought two, and I, just, I never pay attention to what they cost. But, I think at uh, that nominal. Yeah. Our best customer. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> no, we've, John, we've kept it at just I pay my parking tickets, 25. <laughs> I don't ask anybody to tear them up. If I could get more than two, more than one person in my household to go to the compost, I'd happily pay another $25. <laughs> All right. So, Mark, can I ask you to read the motion? Move that the select board authorize the town manager or designee to sell resident 12 month effective 1120 compost only stickers for $25 with seniors age 65 or older eligible for a $15 discounted price. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Great. Um, so now. So before we close. Yes. We should talk about whether or not um, we w there's a way to encourage seniors to be able to park at the depot seniors who aren't commuting to be able to park at the depot. It's come up at a number of Council on Aging meetings that some people would like to be able to park there, but they're not going to spend $150 to do that. Can you talk about that in the future? I, I suggest we discuss that as PTTF and come back to you in January. That sounds great. Excellent. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Mark, for the suggestion. All right. That ends. Please. Yes? Okay. It would be interesting enforcing that one. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get the wrong yet. All right. I actually so, have a couple of ideas, but for later. Okay, great. Um, so uh, that closes the Train Depot parking sticker discussion. Um, next up, we have the discussing meeting efficiency and select board goals. I want to be cognizant Thank of you. time Good here, night, which, is night. Night, Thank you. Um, which is that it's about quarter of 11, and one of the things that we do need to discuss, because it is quite timely, um, is the discussion around Halloween. Yes. Um, so I'd like to ask. Yes. Can I offer something? On Saturday night in Reading, there's going to be a 700 kid football jamboree and Saturday night lights with the families of those 700 all in attendance there. What time is that at and what age is it? It's going to be, you know, probably, it'll probably start in the afternoon and it'll run to early evening. Halloween time. So, and, and the reason I ask about the ages is because, you know, that is the... Was Kindergarten to seventh grade. Boys and girls. And, and is that, was that previously scheduled for another day? 
Yes, last summer. Yes, it was, but they moved it, which sporting events do move due to weather. Holidays don't move due to weather usually. True. Right. So what's, what's happening here for those of you watching at home is that there's been um, some outreach to the, us, some of us on the board um, at a request to recommend that <coughs> trick-or-treating be moved to Saturday due to so far predicted heavy rains and very strong winds of 40 miles an hour, um, peaking during that trick-or-treating time, which is 6 to 8 p.m. on Thursday. Um, there are other towns in the state, as well as in New Hampshire, who have already made this recommendation to move trick-or-treating to Saturday. Um, I'm sure there are people that feel very strongly on each side of this. Um, I, by the very nature of changing something like this due to weather, it has to be last minute. You know, we as a board can choose to recommend this and ask Bob and the staff to coordinate a message to the community should we choose to do this you know but we have actually I understand we have actually no power to decree that trick-or-treating right. shall take place on any given time it's more of a the board recommends that families engage yes. in it's, it would be a recommendation because it's not like we're going to ticket people if they choose to <laughs> trick-or-treat on Thursday right. it's, it's entirely <laughs> private activity yeah, it's, we it's can't just, it's a social construct um, if you will. Yeah. and I just, just I just refreshed weather.com. So Ooh. at 6 p.m. on Thursday, um, the, the chance of, of um, precipitation is at 45%, same for 7 o'clock p.m. with um, winds at 15 miles per hour. Well, that is a lovely change and may very well, Jesse, make it. It does say this. scattered thunderstorms, but it doesn't, it says less than, there's a less than 50% chance of rain and the miles per hour wind is 15. I'm so glad you checked that because when I checked it earlier today, it said 90% and mm -hmm. it still had the gusts at 40. So, I, I mean, if that's the current weather report, I'm inclined to leave it as is and not touch it. I know, I know. It's, and it's change. subject to change, you know, but, weather. Yeah. yeah, but this meeting will be over by that time. <laughs> ah, possibly. <laughs> maybe not, John, maybe not. Um, all right, so, I, I mean, I, you know, I raised it because it got brought to me by residents. Mm -hmm. Given the current weather, I'm inclined to leave it. To, to not make that recommendation to the community. Support agree? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Lovely. Um, so I'm hesitant to take up the next agenda item at quarter of 11. The efficiency of our meetings? <laughs> <laughs> well, and select board goals. And goals. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I so I'm going to suggest we table that unless agree. anyone feels very strongly and would like to go home and anything. <laughs> no? All right. Um, so next, the last thing we have then is just future agendas. And uh, minutes. Yeah. Oh, and minutes, yeah. So Bob, if you can run us through. Yeah, I just want to open that. Uh, the next. Quitter. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne, you're a quitter. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> um, she stayed longer than everybody else. Mm -hmm. I think a future, one future meeting agenda, um, might be a report from the ad hoc in a month or so. Uh, and I got the feeling from our last meeting, we're just sort of, we've got a fairly good mission statement down. And, um, but it needs, you know, with a few, touches and we have gone over three solid options for structure of the committee or of the of the whatever the organization uh -huh. um, my hope was that we could cover that ground in in two more meetings so December or January Which thing are we talking about? Ad hoc. Well, I feel like January would be safe. Bob, could I ask you to see where that might be able to fit in January? Yeah, we don't have a lot of space in December either. I think that's January my bigger concern. We'll yeah, uh, yeah, it, yeah. Had it right. more nicely. Yeah. Um, okay. One of the things that came out of our last meeting um, 
which John, I know you watched, is the fact that we would it would be nice to have designated time to talk about some of the bigger picture goals that um, isn't in, within a meeting interspersed with various um, very specific town Single meetings. subject right. meetings. Right. So with that in mind, um, might I suggest you, December is tough because it is budget time, mm -hmm. um, and November has town meeting. Mm -hmm. um, however, that we find a date where all of us can meet um, with an agenda to be discussed, um, but to have it not include sort of the nitty gritty administrative matters that we generally have to make sure that we finish in any given night. So this be so effectively the, the retreat? The retreat, mm -hmm. if you will. And we can see you know, what form that takes, mm -hmm. and we can talk about possibly having someone else mediate it um, or facilitate it. It would make, it would, I would prefer that personally because it would mean that I could participate and not have to mediate the meeting. Um, so Bob, you raised your hand. Yeah, I don't unfortunately have the 2020 uh, schedule in print. Um, what I can't remember is whether you have three or four meetings before the March 3rd election. It's one or the other. I know there's room on those agendas. Um, in so, March? Uh, no, in either January or February. Well, there's always extra thing comp forums that happen. And there is. Yeah. There is. Um, I, and I'm not saying you shouldn't pick another date, but I'm saying let me do some work and look at your agendas. Because again, my recollection was after December, your agendas were light. And yeah. A couple things have come up tonight, BTTF, maybe the ad hoc. Mm -hmm. But I'm pretty sure you can squeeze some into one of the either three or four meetings before the election, assuming that that's your objective. Okay. So Bob, uh, given, I know we tend to generally avoid move going past a certain date, like you know, our last meeting in December is the 11th, right? So we do have a couple weeks there before, or yeah, a couple weeks before Christmas. Um, so maybe we could try and, and squeeze one in. You'd have to be meeting three weeks in a row to do that. That's, I mean, you can't meet on Christmas week because no one will be here. True. Um, um, so if you wanted to meet the th first week twice, second week twice, and the third week once, maybe that works. So can I recommend that, Bob, I mean, I, I don't know if you're comfortable doing, I know we've discussed a doodle poll, which is that you throw a bunch of dates. Um, Caitlin might be comfortable doing a doodle poll, but. Um, you well, put dates on, and you, you email it to all of us, and everyone responds with their availability within those dates. It makes it very simple to try and find a time when five plus six people can uh, um, Yeah, I've used them, they're great. They're fabulous. So, I'll show you how to do it if you like. Um, Excellent. Um, what what just dates would you like to consider generally? I, I think with that third week in December and then January, February. Okay. okay. Um, because so it's the not week just before Christmas. Um, it's the 11th, the week after is um, We go 18th, 14th. So it's... Week before Christmas. Oh, sorry, that's October. Yeah. yeah. Are, you, are you traveling? Uh, no, but, you know, there's going to be grandchildren swinging from the chandeliers. and they're Bring them to the meeting. Priority. I'm just telling you. And, and men don't typically start shopping until around that time. So just <laughs> oh, so cool. Excellent. Much later. So, uh, if, you can, if you can circulate those dates, and we'll see what works out for people. Um, and... I would suggest that everyone mark in all of their dates availability for December, January, and February because it will take more than one meeting. One more thing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, agenda topic. Um, because I only work under deadlines for the, the, um, the onboarding <laughs> manual, um, you, you, Next month. you need to give me a date maybe in January where I um, – have to produce something. Um, Bob, with the first, I know you said you don't have the 2020 calendar in front of you, but um, shall we say the first meeting in January? Would yeah, that be reasonable? Let me look on my phone and I know when that date is. Um, let's, I think that's in mind. Um, let's say, Andy, the first meeting in January. Okay, what, what's that date? That's what I'm telling you. Uh, thanks. Sure. I mean, I, I have it on my calendar, but I have to put it in my keep notes. Uh, September, uh, excuse December me, January 7th. 7th. I'm sorry, January 7th. Okay. So why don't you plan for that, and then right. Bob, let's see how that works. If it doesn't, we can move that to the 21st, but at least don't tell me have structure. All right. Um, so let's move on to minutes. Well, before we go there, mm -hmm. um, kind of like the Halloween discussion, I just have to tell you that this softball thing has got a real hard window that's going to close on it really soon. 
because of weather. And so whatever we can do, if we don't get it done before the snow comes, they'll start another softball season without it done because doing it in the spring is next to impossible. So I, you know, our, our recreation administrator, as I'm at the start of the meeting, has said they are looking into various work at these fields. I think we need to leave it with them to identify what the priorities are for these fields. I, I disagree. And let them move forward. I, I don't disagree that it's, it, 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 it's their job to do that. I don't disagree with that. But they've hit. This was offered to them six months ago. So, John, we have already talked about this. It is in the hands of the staff. We need to finish the minutes, and it's we're approaching 11 o'clock. Well, if so you I'm think the ask, safety of the girls of this town is no, less important than the not, minutes, do not let's do that. even take that approach, John. That uh, it's because that is the approach we're taking. No, it is absolutely it's highly not. appropriate. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, in this matter, does the rec committee have a role, or are you leaving it up to staff? Um, presumably, Jenna has been working they with have, but recreation. Just to close the loop, as it were. Rec committee has certain meetings. You have to go through a process. Staff can move faster. So. Right. Well, I mean, Jenna has been the one that has communicated to me that they're I working on it, that, that they've done an evaluation of safety, that there's multiple yep. projects. So okay. we've done an evaluation of safety. Yep. Specifically. Mm -hmm. And and and. Um, I am tabling this topic. Just wondering if they have an endpoint. I'm, um, she did not specify. All right. Um, could we get an update at the, our next meeting on this? Sure. From our from from staff or our liaisons direct. That would be that would be. Yeah. Or maybe sooner. Or sooner. Sooner. Sooner the better. All right. Moving on to minutes. So, uh, Mark, can you read the motion for the minutes, please? <laughs> Move that the board approve the meeting minutes of October 15th, 2019 as amended? Amended. amended. They're already amended? They're not already amended. Oh, okay. As? Well, present, well I haven't edited, so. Okay. Right. As amended. <laughs> oh, great. Um, is there a second? Second. All right. Um, discussion. I know I have one edit, um, which is just on the liaison report. Uh, and. Uh, Caitlin, I can send this to you. Okay. Um, I would just change uh, my that line or that um, sentence to Miss Alvarado spoke with the Mass DOT and they indicated that temporary lanes will be painted um, for four lanes. The potential road diet could go into effect in spring 2020, which now may change. But um, so I will send this to you right now. If there are no objections. Okay. Any other edits? Yes. Um, Although I think that um, Caitlin did a fine job summarizing my letter, Bob read a letter from me into the record. I have forwarded that letter to Caitlin to become part of the minutes. I believe you all got a copy of this letter mm -hmm. uh, from Bob. So I just want to add this as an addendum. Yeah. Would as you like me to insert your letter in like where he read it, or do you just want it at, in like the back of the minutes? I, I think you can just, you it's really simple. I can did, copy and paste. You did a good right job, you know, you know, in three or four sentences you said it all. I think you could reference that there's a, an attachment yeah. of, the, of yeah. the letter um, rather than trying to put it in the body. Just clip it on there and you're done. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other minutes? I sent um, a few uh, on Sunday because I promised her I would never do it at, mm -hmm. at five o'clock or six o'clock on the Tuesday. Uh, do you, you want me to read those or? I'm fine. They were just um, typos. So yeah. anyone? If they're typos, yes. I don't. Yes, yeah. as long as they're not content right. changes. Is everybody comfortable with them? No. Right. Yes. Right. Any other edits? All those in favor? Okay. Motion carries. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? S second. All those in favor? 